Recording started, admitting everyone. Thanks, Veronica. Do you want to go over the meeting rules? Yes, I will share screens. Uh, hopefully this time it is sharing the correct screen. Can everyone see my screen? We can, yeah. Perfect. Oops. So sorry. All right. Well, hello everyone. My name is Veronica and I'll be your technical support for tonight. Thank you for joining. Uh, we will start with a few housekeeping rules. This meeting has been called to conduct the business of City of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere with the meetings are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions will be limited to three minutes. No person shall speak except when recognized by myself, and no person shall speak for longer than the given three minutes. Each person shall, shall register to speak at the meeting using their real name. Any person believed to be using a name other than the one they're commonly known by will not be permitted to speak at the meeting. If you're on the phone, you need to press star six to unmute and star nine to raise your hand. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers. All others will participate by voice only. I will enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates them. The chat function is enabled for tonight's meeting and will be used for individuals to communicate with the host, myself. It should be used for technical or online platform related questions only. If an attendee attempts to use the chat for any other reason, the city reserves the right to disable the individual's access to the chat. Only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen during their meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Veronica. First up is the approval of the May 2022 meeting minutes. Does anyone have any edits in addition to what? I think somebody already provided one. I don't believe I have any. Keith, I made an edit, which was um, reposted to the website and it's to delete the reference to 20 is plenty on her um, comment regarding speed on um, sidewalks. Thanks. I can probably display that if you want. That uh, sounds good. Not seeing any additional comments, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes as amended. I move to approve the amended minutes. I'll second that. All in favor? Not seeing Trini on screen. Okay. Thanks, Trini. So the, the minutes are approved unanimously. Okay. With that, we'll turn to public comments. Any member of the public wishing to speak to the board about a transportation matter will have up to three minutes to do so. If you're interested in speaking, please use the raise hand reaction tool and we will start calling on you. Veronica, I see Kurt Nordbeck. All right, let me find your name. Okay, hey, Kurt, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and I will be starting the three minutes. Uh, actually, I, I believe you can unmute yourself right now. So you can start speaking. Okay, yeah, I'm unmuted. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm Kurt Norbeck speaking on behalf of Community Cycles. As you're probably aware, CU is planning construction of a hotel, conference center, and 500 space parking structure at 13th and Grandview. You should have received an email from us about this. Community Cycles has been concerned since this was announced that access via the intersection at Broadway and Grandview across the Broadway multi-use path would be dangerous. Unfortunately, the current plans do indeed propose taking access from this intersection. The hotel operator commissioned a traffic impact analysis for the development. However, its sole focus was on roadway vehicular capacity, 
and gave zero consideration to safety. Indeed, the consultant seemed unaware of the existence of the multi-use path. Vehicular crossings of parallel multi-use paths have been known to be dangerous for decades. Currently, the crossing at Grandview sees very little motor vehicle traffic, with only 70 vehicles crossing the path per day. But the traffic impact analysis projects 150 to 175 peak hour crossings in 2025, a potential conflict almost every 20 seconds, and a total of 1,550 per day, a 22-fold increase. This in and of itself would be a dangerous situation, but it's exacerbated by the 5 to 7% grade on Broadway, which allows uh, bikes to go faster than usual down the hill. CDOT requires a right turn slip lane, but this is deeply inadequate as mit mitigation and will do nothing to address southbound vehicles turning left across the multi-use path. The slip lane also would remove several trees and any landscaping buffer between the multi-use path and traffic. Community Cycles proposes instead closing the east leg of the Broadway Grandview intersection to all but emergency motor vehicles and taking access to the hotel and parking structure via 13th and 15th streets from University. We feel this would be much safer for the 500 or more pedestrians and cyclists per day that use this segment of the Broadway multi-use path and more consistent with the spirit of Boulder's site access regulations. We encourage TAB to give input on this looming safety concern to staff and council. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Any other members of the public interested in speaking during public comment? Please raise your hand. Lynn Siegel. I was wondering when the Whittier burn down thing is going to get fixed and why you can't open up the sidewalk. I go on that every day. And when I come back going west, um, I have to cross the street to go against the traffic. Um, this has been like, I don't know, six months now. We don't even know why this happened. It was probably arson from the developers in town that want to build bigger and better. Um, and meantime, that building is not falling on anyone. They've got plenty of OSB up on the sides. There's no reason they can't open the friggin' path so that people can get through without jockeying around that space. Um, I also heard it's probably homeless folks, which would be another fault of the development community in this town, which is what I'm always complaining about, that we have transportation expenses that cannot afford all these developments in this high-end market and the sprawl that causes people to come in and out of Boulder more and more because they wanna to come to the mountains and they're congesting the area. I find it really distasteful to go out to 28th Street. I don't like it at all. I have to wait a lot. And why aren't there occupancy lights there? Why, aren't there, why isn't there more preference for bicyclists who are in the freezing cold or the hot sun and the cars are, were just sitting there waiting in all these cars in their air conditions and heat, heat false environments. It's really unfair. Um, and if, if you can't afford it, if there's not enough transportation funds for you to do good occupancy level lights, then don't, you know, then do something to stop all this growth. And you got to do something to stop the growth anyway. Stop CU South. It's just costing way too much. And I know, Alex, you're the one who thinks so well about how we can do things efficiently with what we have in Boulder. But even with the best efficiency that we have, we cannot begin to keep up with this massive kind of growth and in these high, the high end type growth that people use their cars a lot and they take up a lot of the space with the ex and drive up the cost of all of the expenses of housing all over Boulder with their parking de demands. And, and then, you know, they're driving all over all the time and congesting things for those who are trying to um, just ride their bikes around for transportation is what I use it for. 
Um, so I'm wondering also about Whittier, please open that up and let us know what happened. Why did that fire happen? And what, what are the impacts of, to transportation that you're experiencing from that? I can tell you, you are experiencing it with me. So, thanks, yeah, thanks. Any other members of the public interested in speaking? Not seeing any, we'll move on to agenda item four, which is a briefing on the 28th and Colorado intersection improvements and the 30th Street corridor improvements. Welcome, Nathan. Good evening, everyone. Are you able to see my presentation okay? Yes. Okay, well, good evening. Uh, my name is Nathan Pope and I'm a senior transportation planner. I'm very excited to give you an update on the implementation of two critical projects, both coming from the 30th and Colorado corridor study. To start, I'll provide some background on how, the, on how the 30th and Colorado corridor study and how we reached this point. Then I'll jump into the two projects. First, the 30th Street Multimodal Improvement Project, followed by the 28th and Colorado Protected Intersection Project. I'll wrap things up with next steps before asking for any questions regarding the status, process, and schedule for either of these two projects. So I think a lot of you are familiar with these studies, but just to get everyone up to speed, let's begin with a quick recap of the extensive work that went into creating the 30th and Colorado corridor studies. The 30th and Colorado corridors study sought to best address safety and current and future modal needs and fulfill the vision of safe, enjoyable, and direct travel for people of all ages and abilities using all modes of transportation. Both the 30th Street and Colorado Ave corridors were identified by the city and CU for detailed study due to their connection between key activity centers. The corridors also contained six of the city's top 10 crash locations at the time. The 2017 to 2019 study looked at existing and future travel conditions and developed design options to improve travel for all modes. The study looked at adding elements like protected bike lanes, business access transit lanes, and enhanced pedestrian infrastructure. A comprehensive community engagement process guided activities to inform and engage community members throughout the study. The community engagement approach included many activities to elicit public input at key decision points, including four community open houses, three online questionnaires, a 16 member community working group, including a member of TAB, targeted outreach to 300 businesses and property owners, information displayed on variable message boards, Facebook advertisements, and tabling at local events. Using the objectives developed with community input, staff and consultants developed five options to improve multimodal travel for each corridor segment. These options were then reviewed for the abil their ability to meet the study's goals and objectives, and then presented to the community for additional feedback. Goals that, goals that each option was evaluated against include the goal of creating safe corridors that feel comfortable for people who live, work, and travel, and the goal of renewed and rev revitalized mobility to reflect current and future travel needs for all ages and abilities. The preferred design for each corridor were then refined and then developed into concepts. To date, several 30th and Colorado corridor study projects have begun implementation. The Colorado and Region Intersection Improvement Project was completed last year, and the 30th and Colorado Protected Intersection Underpass is under construction and scheduled to be completed early next year. The two projects we're looking at today are in the design phase and beginning construction next year. And there are several other projects that are in the initial preliminary design stages and assembling funding. So let's start by looking at the 30th Street Corridor Multimodal Improvements Project. This project is scoped to make improvements on 30th Street from 30th and Colorado uh, at the underpass at 30th and Colorado to just south of 30th and Arapaho intersection. Let's start by looking at how this project aligns with our plans. The project aligns with the city's transportation master plan goals of being safe, equitable, and reliable and provide improved travel choices and support clean air and our climate commitment. This segment of streets has been identified in the low stress uh, walk and bike network plan as needing vertical separation and as a pedestrian improvement area. And last but not least, the core arterial network plan recommends a bikeway along 30th Street. The existing conditions along this section of 30th vary, but generally there are narrow sidewalks, 
on-street bike lanes of five feet and four general purpose uh, travel lanes. Most of the east side of the corridor is CU property and Scott Carpenter Park is on the west side. As you can see from this photo, there are also uh, over poles and overhead power lines running along the corridor. The project's improvements will include the design and construction of raised protected bike lanes on both sides of 30th with wider sidewalks, enhanced bus stops, and landscaping. Raised, cross raised crosswalks will be used when possible across driveways and streets, and a potential speed limit reduction in the corridor will also be studied. The, the facilities will connect to the new 30th and Colorado underpass to the south and to the Boulder Creek multi-use path south of Scott Carpenter, Scott Carpenter Park. The project team is gathering data and exploring options for a possible at-grade crossing at Boulder Creek, um, at the Boulder Creek path for use when the underpass floods. Quick update on the design and construction uh, budget. These improvements are budgeted to cost approximately $6.2 million, with over 75% of those funds coming from outside grants. Okay, let's take a quick, quick trip along the future of 30th Street. Please keep in mind that these plans are around 60% and not final. I also wanna note that these graphics represent a fraction of the work that has been going into designing both of these projects. While we're looking at a simplified graphic, there's a huge amount of work being done behind the scenes, including right of way, utilities, landscaping, geotechnical stormwater and environmental planning. But with that in mind, let's dive in here. Um, let's start at the south end of the project, right near the 30th and Colorado protected intersection and underpass. And we'll head north along the new raised bike lane parallel to the sidewalk. I'm gonna track along here with uh, pretending that I'm on my little red bicycle here and take you, um, we're going northbound now. We have a six foot bike, um, raised separated bike path um, with a uh, sidewalk to our right. And then we're traveling um, with a, a buffer between us and the uh, regular travel lanes. You'll see as we cross any driveway or we come to any bus stop like we're doing here, we'll have um, some kind of uh, indication pavement marking that we're uh, crossing a bicycle facility with that green paint. Here we meet the Boulder Creek path and you can see there's a connection down here and we go across the existing bridge that's going to remain over the Boulder Creek path. Anytime you see the separation of the bike lane and the sidewalk, that's generally because we are accommodating an existing utility pole or because there's existing trees that we wanna preserve. In this case, on, along this section of the corridor, we have um, some existing trees that are some new trees that we're gonna be adding. And as we reach um, a driveway like this one into a CU facility, we're bending out the bike lane a bit from the intersection to allow vehicles to um, turn and then yield to the uh, people crossing the street. We'll come here to another bus stop and then a raised crossing at Marine. And then we'll continue to the future 30th and Arapaho protected intersection project you see here in yellow. I'm gonna cross the street and pretend like I need to do a U-turn and come back. We're right now by the um, fire station where we're gonna jump onto our uh, raised and separated protected um, bicycle facility. Cross this bus stop and then we're um, preserving a tree that we found in here and um, coming up to Scott Carpenter Park, the entrance. Here's the entrance here where we have a little bit of a bend out and we're able to have a, a larger bend out um, at the exit where cars can first yield to folks crossing on the sidewalk in the bicycle facility and then proceed to make their turn. We're bending away farther from the um, street right now to preserve all of our wonderful trees that we have in here. And then we come into the Boulder Creek path and the existing bridge where we'll actually jump onto the street for a moment before coming back up to sidewalk level. Um, we have another bus stop here and we'll have another crossing at Shadow Creek Drive. We're getting into the uh, narrowest section of the project where we have a lot of uh, right-of-way constraints. Um, we're also having some, there's also a significant grade um, that we're having to work around. Um, if you're familiar with this section of the project, there's a big retaining wall um, along the west side of 30th Street right here. Um, that'll uh, remain, but we're looking to um, use some of our public art budget to install a mural or something similar along there. And then we'll travel back to the 30th Street um, underpass and the protected intersection. So that was a quick tour. Um, that's a quick tour of the current design of the 30th Street multimodal improvements. Like I mentioned, this is 60% design um, and the design team has been working hard to, to get these uh, towards completion, towards final design. Let's next look at the 28th and Colorado protected intersection project. This project was initially scoped to extend uh, improvements along Colorado, 
from Regent Drive through the intersection at 28th Street. So this section. In May of this year, the project received additional grant funding through the Colorado Department of Transportation's Revitalizing Main Streets funding program. This funding was integrated into the intersection project and will be used to complete the gap on Colorado between 28th and 30th Street. In summary, while this project is focused on the intersection, we're able to make improvements along Colorado from Regent all the way to 30th. Once again, this project aligns closely with the city's plans. Colorado is, a recommend, is recommended for vertical separation through the low stress walk and bike network plan. And the core arterial network plan recommends a bikeway and a busway, both of which are included in, in the design. The existing conditions at 28th and Colorado include a complex intersection with the 28th Street front, frontage road running closely parallel to 28th Street. Today, Colorado Ave has a sidewalk, on-street bike lanes, and four general purpose travel lanes. The southwest corner of the intersection was recently improved as part of the Regent and Colorado Intersection Improvement Project, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. The project will improve Colorado Ave and the intersection at 28th by installing protected intersection elements and signal timing modifications to improve safety for pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers. The, new, the improvements will also include newly protected east and westbound raised bike lanes along Colorado Ave that are set back at the intersection to improve visibility and reduce turning vehicle conflict. A median shift on Colorado will provide an additional westbound left turn lane from Colorado onto southbound 28th Street. This additional turn lane will help to ensure reliable travel times for all mode, minimizing vehicles queuing in, into the through lanes and impeding bus access into the new business access transit lanes that are also along Colorado. The current design also replaces an existing right turn bypass or slip lane to reduce conflict and allow people allow extra space for people walking and biking. Once completed, these improvements will connect the existing Colorado and region intersection safety improvements and the soon to be connected 30th and Colorado underpass project. We're also looking at applying for TIP funding a, for a future project to extend the Colorado improvements west from Regent to Folsom. Taking a quick look at this project's budget, these improvements will uh, cost approximately 2.6 million with around 20% coming from the city. So here's the intersection as it is today. To orient yourself, we have CU's main campus and Folsom Field over here to the west, downtown Boulder and 28th Street um, continuing to the north. CU's east campus and the 30th and Colorado protected intersection and underpass to the east. And 28th Street continues um, to the south as US 36. This is a complex intersection with the addition of the 28th Street frontage road and University Heights Ave, adding additional conflict points at several places. As I mentioned, the southwest quadrant of the intersection was recently improved as part of the Colorado and Region Intersection Safety Improvement Project. So improvements to this corner are not part of this project. There's also a right turn bypass in the northwest uh, corner adjacent to a multi-use path that connects to Boulder Creek and the Boulder Creek path. Okay, so let's bring on our improvements. I'll walk you through this, starting with the bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. We have green conflict markings and crosswalks at each, each leg of the intersection. And we have these new um, protected intersection islands on the east corners. There is marked space for people biking to wait before crossing the street. And these, little, and these um, are connected to raised protected bike lanes on both sides of Colorado. For bus riders, there are new business access transit um, lanes, also known as bat lanes, along Colorado. We also have larger enhanced bus stops to allow for uh, longer articulated buses. In the center, you can see the addition of an additional westbound left turn lane. This additional turn lane will help to ensure reliable transit and travel times by minimizing queuing vehicles backing up into the through lane and affecting the business access transit lane. In the Northwest corner, we have repurposed the right turn bypass or slip lane to reduce conflicts and allow for 
additional space for people walking and biking. This also provides a better connection to the multi-use path that connects to Boulder Creek and a more direct connection um, for folks crossing CU or accessing CU's main campus and a raised crosswalk at University Heights. All these improvements help to better organize this complex intersection and improve safety and reliability for all. So those are the two projects we wanted to update you on. As the design for each progresses, we have a couple of next steps to share with you. The 30th and Colorado Corridor study perform, performed an extensive community engagement process that led to the development and approval of the two project alternatives. For final implementation, the community engagement is at the inform level of the, of the engagement strategic framework. That means we will provide the community with updates on what to expect next, the coming improvements, and the project timelines. We will be hosting a public information session on July 20th to update the community members on both these projects and their timelines. We'll be working with key stakeholders like CU and adjacent property owners as we finalize the designs. While not exactly the same, the timeline for both of these projects is very similar. We will be hosting a public information session um, next month, and then I'll return to TAB in the fall um, with another update. After that, construction begins early next year, and both projects estimate to be completed in 2024. So to wrap everything up, once completed, these two projects, along with the 30th and Colorado underpass, will complete two vital corridors on the core arterial network. These projects will provide nearly a mile of continuous protected bicycle lanes and protected intersections, and a half mile of new business access transit lanes. The projects will serve to connect the University of Colorado Maine and East campuses, Scott Carpenter Park, the Boulder Creek Path, three B-cycle stations, and over 6,000 adjacent residents. Tonight from TAB, we are hoping to hear if you have any questions regarding the status, process, and schedule of these two projects. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much um, for your time, and I'm happy to do my best to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, Nathan. It's a fantastic presentation and visuals made it really clear what we're, what we're talking about. Uh, Tila. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, I also enjoyed the little, uh, the, the fly through and the little red dot. That was uh, very effective. So uh, I appreciate that. And I, I would encourage that kind of approach if you're doing other presentations and public engagement on this, it was really um, easy to follow and helpful. Um, I did Great. hear you mention uh, that the team is still considering how and whether to adopt an at grade crossing um, of 30th Street at Boulder Creek because the, the path floods and in fact it did flood this last week. Um, not so it was impassable, but at times it has become impassable. Uh, given that we're at the 60% um, status level now, when, when are we going to make a decision about whether to provide that at grade crossing and what, what additional information are you looking for or feeling out before we make that decision? Sure, um, that's definitely something that we're, we're looking at. We actually have a camera out there um, now or very soon where we're um, counting the number of folks who um, would be crossing there where we've been waiting for it to, to flood so we can get some some gather some data to see um, you know just get an idea of how many folks are, are crossing that grade if the underpass is closed um, we have a couple of options um, a couple of ideas that we're, we're floating around on what a at grade crossing would look like we don't want to encourage people to cross there if it's not flooded but we want to make sure it's safe to do so if it is so mm -hmm. we're still um, collecting that data and then um, really figuring out what the best option would be based on those volumes I don't know if um, Garrett or um, Michael wants to add anything to that answer uh, maybe okay. I, would, I would just add that um, we've had the uh, uh, bike uh, crash uh, report there and there have been no no reported bad crashes at that location. Thanks, Michael. Michael is the project manager for this project. Okay, thank you. Um, I had another question and I forgot it, but if I remember it, I'll raise my hand again. <laughs> Please do. Thanks. Any other questions or comments from TAB, Ryan? Uh, so I'll go. Nathan, thanks. I'll also compliment on the presentation. I am. Um, I also enjoyed the um, overlay of the the current and the future. It, that really helped me to to, to visualize it. Um, so th thank you for that. I also enjoyed watching the um the slip the slip just disappear, just dissolve. <laughs> and, uh, so in any case, that that that's great. Um, one I guess I have two questions. One just on the descriptive statistics. So I think I heard you say about a mile together. The two projects are about a mile of new separated uh, bikeways. 
can you do I have that right? And can you say is that like about half and half for each, or how would you just sort of break down that that mile between the two? Um, I think the majority is on 30th Street. Um, I'd have to go back and get the exact details for you, um, but starting at Regent, going to 30th Street, and then up to Arapaho. Okay, thank you. And then my other question, maybe a harder one, is on. Um, it seems like there's still some some double up turn lanes in there, and I'm just wondering if there's if you had any. Any been any further thought, or there might be any further opportunity to consider uh, alternatives to that, or does that feel pretty pretty resolved at this point? Yeah, so that um, was something that was looked at uh, closely in the, in the corridor study. Um, you're, there's the double uh, left. The only double left that I'm uh, thinking of is the one from uh, 30th Street onto southbound uh, 28th Street, headed towards US to US 36. Um, my understanding is that that was um, included because um, the queues, the amount, the volume of folks who are, are making those left turns is quite high and the queues was backing up into the travel lane and even backing up, it was modeled that it would back up all the way to 30th street and prohibit the um, buses who are making a, a left from northbound 30th onto westbound Colorado, preventing them from accessing the uh, business access transit lane. Um, so that's something that we're um, carrying over from the, the concept design. Um, and I think we're something that we've we've looked at pretty closely. I don't know if Garrett, if you want to add any extra comments to that. Uh, no, I think you captured the, the the analysis of the corridor study, so nothing additional to add, Nathan. Thanks. Okay, so then just to summarize, it's the yeah the, the, that double of turns is intended to stay at this point. There's no there's no serious consideration at this point. Of, uh, um, great. Thank you again, Nathan. Good presentation. Thanks, Ryan. I've got a similar question about double Fs, but at, and I know it's it's not in this project, but it was mentioned that Arapaho and 30th is something that's going into design this year. Is that a location where we could look at removing the, the double Fs for all of the approaches? Because I think we've, we saw initially a cost estimate of $6 million at this location, mostly for right of way acquisition and wondering if if the, all those double lefts are really warranted and we could save a, a ton of money on the project by dropping down to a single left turn lane. Uh, I didn't uh, reference my name in the earlier comment, just for the record, Garrett Slater, Principal Transportation Engineer for Capital Projects. And um, to respond to that, Alex, so I would say that uh, we are expecting that we will conduct that level of operational analysis once we actually get into the study of uh, and, and the, the, the design development of the 30th and Arapaho intersection. So I, uh, I, I can say that uh, we will look at each of the approaches to uh, identify opportunities to uh, reduce the number of left turn lanes because um, like you, I'm interested in trying to find opportunities to save costs for this intersection as much as possible. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Yeah, this, these projects are neat in how they they overlap and are really starting to build a network. And it feels like we're giving a bunch of younger residents, especially in this area, some really good multimodal options, not only with transit, but the walking and the biking. And it, it seems like if we're successful in doing those things, hopefully the, the double left turns to preserve or even expand the auto capacity aren't, aren't as necessary. And we can save some money on construction and right of way and, and use those savings to even further the network would be my hope. But yeah, this is this is very exciting stuff. Anything else from Tab? I think we're all set. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Tab. With that, we'll move on to Agenda item five, which is Garrett Slater providing us with our second of three discussions about the 2022 to 2027 capital improvement program. Okay. All right, can you see the full screen? Great. All right, well, good to be with you tonight uh, to continue the conversation from last month to talk about the draft 23-28 capital improvement program. So what we're going to 
discuss is just a reminder and an overview of what the CIP is and why we go through this process, uh, where the funding comes from, and then we'll review each of the programs and projects that are comprising our CIP, what the next steps will be, and then follow it up with some discussion and questions. So the, the CIP or the Capital Improvement Program provides funding for us to be able to undertake projects that are uh, uh, greater and, and value than $50,000 and happen over a multi-year period, uh, which is beyond the capacity of the annual operating budget that is uh, more focused on um, maintenance and uh, routine sort of annualized uh, programs. So the Capital Improvement Program is the vehicle by which we can implement the projects and the larger programs that fulfill the transportation master plan in alignment with the policies identified in the 2019 TMP. And also in recognition of the fact that we have literally billions of dollars of assets that we want to preserve and take care of, but also enhance. And the CIP is the way, by which, or the way uh, in which we uh, take care of those assets, as well as uh, make investments in improving them for all of our users and our residents. So the current, uh, or the, excuse me, the draft 2328 CIP is proposing an $88 million total investment over the next six years with uh, currently $10 million in grants. Uh, we hope after the next several months that that number will go upward. Um, the average total of the CIP is approximately 13 million per year with our multimodal programs comprising about $8 million of that total each year. The funding for the CIP is largely based on sales tax, like all of transportation funding, uh, as well as the grants which we referenced, and also is funded and provided by the uh, Highway Users uh, Trust Fund, which is the gas tax, uh, various miscellaneous, and then also development funds. So there are three specific funds which transportation can draw from. So the transportation fund represents the greatest majority. Um, it's uh, rough of that $88 million. Uh, it's uh, approximately $80 million. And the transportation development fund of that uh, 88 total is about $7 million. And the Boulder Junction Fund currently has no identified capital improvement projects uh, in the next six years. The, uh, the, the most of what were identified as key public improvements and Boulder Junction phase one have been implemented or completed. And as the city is looking to the future and the possibility of a phase two of the Boulder Junction area, which would be uh, east of the railroad tracks and north of Pearl Parkway and west of Foothills and south of Belmont uh, in that area, uh, I expect that there would be a master planning process comparable to phase one that uh, might identify key public improvements uh, that the city might undertake to make the way for uh, development to occur or uh, for it to occur within a partnership sort of format as it did in other sort of uh, venues throughout the phase one effort. So um, nothing uh, for the time being on uh, the Boulder Junction Fund. So we uh, are, are proud of the long history of turning our uh, dimes and quarters into dollars with uh, the grant programs available to us at the city. The largest source of those grant funds in the past have been through the Transportation Improver Program or the TIP funds through the Denver Regional Council of Governments or Dr. Cog. And uh, by far that, they, that, that is the source of uh, most of our grant funds. The uh, Highway Safety Improvement Program funds provides targeted improvements uh, for us to make enhancements and improvements at uh, intersections or high crash locations. And then we have the Transportation Alternatives Program, which is a CDOT program for providing funding for uh, providing greater transportation choices, such as biking and walking uh, along key uh, important community corridors. And then finally, we have the Safe Routes to School program, which uh, uh, a recent example of that that was just constructed as uh, along Lehigh and the Mesa Elementary School, uh, Bear Creek Elementary School corridor that uh, allows us to uh, provide enhancements to uh, um, making safer routes for school for uh, children and their families. There are also a host of uh, new federal grant opportunities that are in front of us. The uh, one that uh, is grabbing uh, our attention and we think will um, be the, 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 the 
the most likelihood of getting funded for the city would come through what's called the Safe Streets and Roads for All, the SS4A. And I think some of our TAB members have been keyed into this and have been uh, sending along the uh, the notices of uh, funding opportunities, or they're uh, called NOFOs that come from the, the federal government. So uh, we appreciate uh, all of the TAB members uh, keeping us tuned into these opportunities. Um, because uh, as much as we keep our eyes open for it and sign up and subscribe for these channels, we just want to make sure that we've got a wide net and we're not missing anything. And so the uh, call for uh, projects deadline on that one would be in September, on September 15th. And uh, once we uh, uh, sort of get uh, past this next milestone of submitting our phase two TIP projects, we'll uh, be working on an application for SS4A. The difference there is we are allowed to submit a number of applications for TIP, whereas SS4A, we can only sit a, submit a single application, and it has to be either for a plan or for infrastructure implementation. Um, so we have to be very targeted in what we want, what we want to pursue. The Reconnecting Communities Pilot Program is another opportunity that they don't have a date for that's a, a deadline just yet. And that would uh, allow us to build infrastructure to overcome uh, community barriers, whether they are a river or a railroad or a major arterial or a state highway. Um, there might be opportunities there. Um, like SS4A, we'll only be able to submit for a singular project. And so uh, we're still waiting for more information to come forward on that opportunity. And then finally, there's the Strengthening Mobility and Revolutionizing Transportation Grant, or SMART. Um, so uh, I, I often wonder how many hours go into creating these acronyms from the folks in DC. Uh, in, in any case, this, uh, this one would be a, a great opportunity for us to continue to expand the investment we're making in our SMART traffic signal and interconnection uh, 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 infrastructure that we have throughout the, the network. So we'll be keeping an eye open on those opportunities as well. All right, so uh, we will continue to uh, do our very best to, uh, to, to pursue these grant opportunities as they make sense in consult consultation with our stakeholders, uh, including TAB, of course. And um, uh, what is uh, working against us at present, uh, and this is not a surprise to anybody, is that purchasing power is being reduced uh, as inflation continues to go up. And I'm sure we've all been seeing the news about uh, how we're seeing inflation rates uh, that are exceeding 40-year uh, uh, history levels. And uh, what we're seeing that of, is of particular impact is uh, in the infrastructure market that the inflation rates are um, uh, at rates we haven't seen uh, many of us in our entire careers. Um, so I think I mentioned last month that our asphalt price increases year over year were 15%. And we're hearing that as oil costs continue to rise, that it could be even higher going from 22 into 23. So uh, we're bracing ourselves for what the future might hold. But the, these numbers on this slide come from the Colorado um, Department of Transportation Cost Index. So uh, the uh, I, I, before I, I want to make sure I convey the point here on the, the inflation factor, this is all the more reason it's necessary for us to pursue grant opportunities so that we can expand the ability of our, our limited local funds to be able to implement the projects we know we need to uh, accomplish our TMP goals. So as I noted, our CIP is comprised of both programs and projects with programs representing, representing about 60% of the overall investment and individual single one-time projects about 40%. And this is a lot harder to look at than this, uh, this pie graph, but this is the breakout of the detail of each of the individual programs, which I will get into here in a moment. I have highlighted some of these rows in yellow, and that is on purpose to show you uh, how we have repurposed some of our existing funding into a new program. And I'll get to that in a moment. And then we have the individual projects also highlighted in yellow as a new project that was not part of the CIP for last year. All right, and then within the Transportation Development CIP, uh, as noted, this is a much smaller portion of the overall funding program for the CIP. We have um, uh, some ongoing routine items for signal maintenance and upgrades, 
The 28th and Colorado intersection is being funded from the Transportation Development Fund. And then we also have some minor development coordination that uh, happens as we coordinate uh, opportunities for adjacent development from a private source with our public funding. All right, so we're gonna take a deeper dive into each of the individual program areas now. So for 23 to 28, the pavement management program is targeted uh, at uh, nearly $5 million, more or less each year. And we are projecting a 3% increase each year to try to do our best to try to mitigate some of that inflation that I was referencing. And this is a TMP investment priority one. And as we've discussed with TAB a number of times in recent years, um, we look for opportunities to leverage the PMP to make investments in our Vision Zero efforts. And now, uh, uh, as well, the core arterial network. And um, the way that we prioritize the work of the pavement management program is we survey all the city streets, uh, which we have 300 center line miles. And we survey approximately a third of that system uh, every single year so that we have an ongoing overall condition index score to help us uh, determine where we need to be focusing our efforts year in and year out. And um, the image you see on the lower right is an example of that leveraging of the program where we spent uh, money to make enhancements along Folsom with the buffered bike lane. And uh, the distribution that we're showing for this in terms of how that would be allocated is 50% to roadway, 20% to bike and ped, and 10% to transit. On the pedestrian programs, this is focused on three line items. So the enhancements of missing sidewalk links and building pedestrian crossing treatments. Um, which you can see the, the Folsom and Taft location on the lower right, as well as some um, missing link in North Boulder uh, that was constructed a few years ago. We also have the pedestrian program that goes into entire neighborhoods and upgrades all of the sidewalk and degraded ramps each year. And then we have the, the reactive program where if folks uh, would like to replace the degraded sidewalk in front of their property, we will partner with them 50-50. So we are showing all of these investments at the 100% pedestrian um, modal level. And uh, we also use condition level and program guidance documents. Uh, for, we have a sidewalk program document that was created in 2010 that is our guiding document for how we make these investments. So the multi-use path programs are split 50-50 between bike and ped. And uh, like the other programs, we use condition level and maintenance frequency to prioritize our work. And you can see some of the, the um, images on the lower right here that show the area and the, the growing gardens, community gardens by the North Boulder Rec Center. And this uh, is comprised of two line items. So one is for enhancements, which has largely been focused in the confluence area out by airport, Andrus, and Valmont and 61st. And then the multi-use path capital maintenance, which takes care of ped bridge replacements and repaving of existing pathways. Then the bridge asset management program is, uh, helps us to take care of the roughly 300 or so structures and bridges that we have around our transportation network, whether they be on uh, vehicular streets or along uh, bike and pedestrian pathways. And we use a bridge health index to help us prioritize our work and make improvements, such as the uh, examples you can see here, one at 15th Street and one in North Boulder where we did some culvert lining. All right, so changes from last year's CIP to this year include the 14th and Canyon traffic signal and the repurposing of multimodal safety programs into the core arterial network. So we'll take a, a, a bit of a closer look at that. Um, we also, uh, so I, I also wanted to, um, so I'll get to these items in just a moment, but I, what I also wanted to note is uh, at the top of the programs, we have what's called TIP local match and TMP implementation. And that's a, a pretty large dollar value each year. And so I don't want to, uh, I, I wanna make sure we give that its proper attention. So um, I'm gonna go back a few slides here and take a look at um, our transportation fund. Uh, the very top row shows the TIP local match and TMP implementation. 
This is the line item that allows us to provide a local match for pursuing grants. We, we call that TIP local match, but it's actually used for all of the grant opportunities that um, we pursue, whether it's HSIP or TAP or this new SS4A. Um, this will be the line item that we use to uh, repurpose as local match. So when you look from 24 to 28 in those individual cells, you'll see uh, somewhere between three to 3.2 million. And so we are hopeful that a decent chunk of the 24 and 25 values that you see on that row will be used towards successful TIP applications uh, and the cycles we're in this year and then the following cycle. And also hopefully with the SS4A and RCP federal grant opportunities that they will be providing that local match. And then uh, sometimes, uh, not often, but sometimes we have uh, an opportunity for just general TMP implementation uh, and that this funding could go to. But uh, uh, in my tenure here, it's pretty much entirely gone towards uh, providing local match. So. I'm going to go back now to uh, the slide where I was talking about how it will be used. So uh, as noted, it's approximately an average of 3 million a year. And for the 23 to 25 tip, it's right now, if we are successful in all of those, uh, the applications that we've got in that would provide 1.6 million in local match. And for the 24 to 27, for which projects uh, applications are due in December, we don't yet know what the amount will be because we don't yet know for sure which projects are going to be submitted. Uh, as we've uh, done with uh, TAB here in recent months and selecting projects to, to be carried forward to an application, uh, we'll do that again this fall uh, in preparation for that uh, deadline. And then we'll know what the additional amount would need to be for the uh, these future TIP projects. And then uh, also it would provide, uh, as noted, the uh, funding for these additional forthcoming federal grant opportunities and also uh, provide supplemental funding to the 19th Street project. So um, the, 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 the situation on 19th Street is uh, we expected that we would be underway with construction by now, but uh, the project has incurred some de delay both for uh, floodplain permitting reasons as well as Excel undergrounding. Um, so it's it's a good thing that we're getting the uh, the, the electrical uh, power facilities undergrounded because uh, that's uh, uh, taken advantage of some of the funds we've got with our new Excel franchise agreement. But uh, it has pushed out the timeline for us to be able to get that project under construction. And since we're in a time of extraordinary inflation, we're hoping to use some of that um, TMP implementation for the 19th Street project uh, to cover those um, budget situations there. All right, so now on to some of the other individual project line items. Uh, we had a presentation from Nathan on 28th in Colorado, so I'm not going to go into the detail uh, on this one, uh, other than to say that uh, it is also going to be the recipient of community culture and resiliency safety tax funding. Uh, so it's, we'll be getting a small amount of funds to uh, help us be able to provide that additional match for the um, revitalizing Main Streets grant that uh, Nathan referenced to help us close the, the link on the Colorado corridor between 28th and 30th. Then the 30th Street project, uh, Nathan also did a great job highlighting. And uh, so similar uh, to 28th in Colorado, uh, this one is also going to be the recipient of the Community Culture Resiliency and Safety Tax Funding to, to help us um, um, deal with some of the inflationary situation that's uh, is going to likely happen on this corridor. So um, moving on to the next project here. And so this is one we talked about and was included in last year's CIP. Um, so there are a couple of projects included on this slide. One is the regional transportation, uh, regional technology and operations uh, transportation grant which will help to uh, better interconnect our system of signals and connecting them to, to broadband so that we can have uh, better operation in real time uh, and, and be dynamically responsive to the operation of our system. And it will also be, uh, 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 we've also got a line item in there for safer signals that will be replacing signal heads so that we can accomplish some of our vision zero goals as well as uh, a signal replacement at Broadway and Regent. We also have the Highway Safety Improvement or HSIP uh, Vision Zero Traffic Signal Reconstructions at 
uh, three locations, baseline of Mohawk, Folsom and Pine, and baseline of Broadway. And we expect that uh, we'll be, uh, so we are expecting to get the design going this year with construction slated for 2023. And that is about $1 million in federal funding with $100,000 in local city match. The East Arapaho multi-use path, uh, you've seen recently for the SEEP that was approved or recommended by, by uh, Uwalta City Council, which they endorsed. And that project is also slated for construction in 2023, uh, $1.9 million project uh, with a, a uh, $760,000 in federal grant. And you can see the, the distribution allocation, allocation uh, um, uh, for each of the modes on the lower left. And this project will be making the enhancements in the sections where there are not multi-use path and building them um, better where, uh, they, where they're presently inadequate. I'll be uh, providing an update on downtown Boulder Station right after this presentation, but uh, this project is also in the CIP and is slated for construction in 2023. We have funding both from Dr. Cog as well as from RTD to allow us to, to make this project uh, come to fruition. And we also have a new CIP project and that is for 14th and Canyon. So as part of the gate expansion to 14th Street, we don't initially need to replace the traffic signal, but what we've learned in coordination from RTD is that we will likely need to reconstruct those signals to accommodate some of the, 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 the bus turning movements and all the directions that they would like to see them happen, uh, which wouldn't be possible with the, the situation we have today. So we would need to relocate some of the poles and uh, also look at uh, changing the, the controller location and so that would be um, a project that we would work on delivering in 2025. And this is city funding only with a pro proposed total of $650,000. And finally, not included in the transportation fund CIP, but included in the CCRS, uh, CIP. So that's not something that TAB would provide a recommendation on because it was approved by the voters. And so we are, will be working on them, uh, these projects here starting in 2023. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that you are aware of it is that uh, we'll be starting design work on the replacement of the Central Avenue Bridge, which is located in the Flatiron Business Park, just west, or excuse me, east of 55th Street. We will also be uh, starting on replacement of corroded signal poles, and it will also provide short-term uh, funding boost for the pavement management program around, uh, around the city. So those are some of the highlights of the projects that uh, are in the CIP, as well as changes from last year's CIP. So next steps are, we would like to uh, get that uh, workshop and bike tour scheduled so that we can go out and look at some of this stuff on the ground. And at the July tab meeting, we'll be asking for a formal recommendation of the CIP to planning board. And then at the August planning board meeting, there will be a public hearing where then uh, uh, they'll be making a recommendation to city council uh, who will then review and approve the CIP as a part of the overall budget process um, uh, through uh, uh, early fall. So with that, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you might have about the information that was included in the memo or this presentation. Thanks, Garrett. I think I only have one quick question, so I'll go first. Did you mention something happening in the future at Broadway and Regents with the signal? Yes, so the Safer Signals project is slated to replace the two signal poles on the east side of Broadway. So northeast and southeast corner. I, I, I think I might anticipate, be anticipating where you're going with this and that we have a tip application along Broadway that uh, would be reconstruction, reconstructing portions of that intersection. So we are aware that we don't want to spend um, both federal grant money and city money on reconstructing a signal that this project on, uh, if it's funded through the current TIP application would then come and, and remove. So um, 
we will study this and uh, try to situate the poles, the new traffic signal poles in a place that would not be in conflict with the proposed project that would come forward through the Broadway uh, transit corridor project. If we don't think we can do that, then we will just uh, defer that funding through for the safer signals. But if that's not your if that's not your question, um, I'm happy to take it. But I did want to just put that out there. No, no, that, that was helpful. Thanks. Any other questions from Tab? Tila. Thank you. Thanks, Garrett. Um, I had a, not a terribly related question, but I, I think might feel like a related question about the signal pole replacement at Folsom and Pine. Um, because when we were talking about Folsom and Pine last year, we were also talking about enhancing a few things at that intersection, specifically talking about um, trying some protected intersection treatments. And so I had a similar sort of concern, like if we plonk down brand new poles, does that fix the location of the concrete and preclude um, a different um, and more vulnerable user-friendly treatment at Folsom and Pine? Or is this also something that is, is top of mind for you, or at least you're, you're building in flexibility for, for changing that intersection as part of a, a more elaborate treatment of that intersection in the future time? Yeah, I would say that it's certainly top of mind, Tila. And I, I as to the, um, I guess, the scope and magnitude of how much the budget for that project can accommodate, I, yeah. I, I, it's going to be very tight. Understood. I, I also think, uh, without committing to anything, that we're, we can explore a range of treatments. Um, uh, of course, the, the Vision Zero Innovation Program has um, implemented lower cost treatments, and we might be able to explore those sorts of ideas and options for Folsom and Pine in, in the face of a, a really tight budget situation. Okay. Tila, um, I'll, I'll just yes. add, um, I believe Devin and team are looking at potential opportunities there at Folsom and Pine. Devin, can you chime in here? Yeah, Devin Joslin, Principal Traffic Engineer. That is correct, Natalie. We have been working with some consultants to develop some conceptual designs for um, what's referred to as a compact protected intersection. So that is one concept we're looking at uh, as we're considering the signal design, um, we are taking into account future, future projects and concepts um, of that nature. Okay, so but did you understand the thrust of my question, which was if we plunk down brand new signal poles, then we might be stuck for quite a long time with where those, those poles are? Correct, so we, we are looking as best we can at removing them from the, pushing them out, if you will, to give more okay. future projects. Great, thank you, that was helpful. Um, and then my last comment's more of a comment than a question, um, but I just wanted to acknowledge um, the work, Garrett, that went into sort of parsing out the numbers on that multimodal distribution and which users are served. Um, you know, it's not, it used to just be, you know, multiples of 25% because there were four things and we were dividing them among four different user classes. And so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge that, you know, this is something we've been talking about and I appreciate the effort that went into and in trying to really parse out who's getting helped. I am a little curious what went into those numbers. We talked, I think, briefly about uh, looking at volumes of, of people served, for instance, um, as a way to, to push those numbers. But um, I appreciate sort of the, the attempt and the repeated attempts over a number of years now to kind of identify a little bit more accurately who's, who's getting what out of these projects. And I just wanted to, to bring attention to that and say thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from Tab? Not seeing any. With that, we can move on to agenda item six. Maybe also Garrett with an update on the downtown Boulder station seat. All right, so um, this is uh, uh, another opportunity to uh, visit with you about the expansion of the downtown Boulder station. 
And uh, we'll be coming uh, to you next month for a recommendation and public hearing on the SEEP. Uh, but we wanted to spend tonight just providing an update and status on where we are with the project. So um, first, some background. So past studies have shown that the downtown Boulder station has accommodated more buses and passengers than it was designed to serve. And there's, so there's a need for station capacity to increase over time, particularly as uh, progress is being made on the State Highway 119 BRT implementation. And so this gate expansion will help to address some of the capacity needed by improving transit operations and enhancing connections to the station for people accessing it by foot, bicycle, or personal vehicle. So the existing conditions, which you can see in the images on the screen here, show that uh, uh, there is definitely some crowding going on. And uh, there are even gates that are, uh, in addition to 14th Street north of Canyon, there are gates along Canyon Boulevard. And uh, the station actually serves nearly the same number of bus operation as Denver's Union Station, while having half the gate capacity. And so right now we know ridership is low and service cuts have been in place, but uh, we expect and uh, anticipate that into the future um, that, that service demand will continue to grow and increase. And we want to have the facilities to accommodate that service in um, whatever way and shape it might uh, come forward. So the scope of the project is that um, we'll be providing five additional bus gates uh, providing wider sidewalks and urban um, design and landscaping and providing information kiosks and wayfinding. And uh, we still are uh, not knowing for sure which of the routes will be serviced at these additional gates, but it may include the 200 series, the dash or the jump. Um, RTD hasn't committed to that yet, but their service planners will be working on that over the next couple of years. So here's another aerial sort of perspective view of the expansion that uh, helps put it in perspective in relation to the civic area, Boulder High School, and the existing downtown Boulder Station. So there have been a few minor changes from the last time we visited with TAB about the concept design for 14th Street. And we've been working closely with stakeholders along the corridor with BBSD and along with RTD to uh, make sure that we can build a facility that the buses can use and operate. And so that will uh, we'll show on the next slide here. So what you can see here, uh, we conducted both electronic uh, CAD simulations, but more importantly, we conducted on the ground turning tests of the buses. And what we learned is that the Buses at 14th Street and the intersection of Arapahoe are not uh, able to make that westbound right turn and turn into Arapahoe without encroaching into the eastbound left turn lane that would go northbound onto 14th Street. And the uh, RTD operators, as well as their union, said that they would not allow any buses to make that movement unless we can provide the uh, ability for them to not encroach into oncoming traffic. And so we worked with our operations team and identified that the need for that left turn lane is, is um, probably not very high and that the left turns can turn out of the general purpose through lane there. And so we're proposing to stripe out that left turn lane to accommodate the, the, the right turn um, southbound to westbound Arapahoe movement. Further, uh, the uh, at the time we did the test with RTD, the uh, um, it was the, the morning drop off period at Boulder High School, and when it came time to test turning left to go eastbound on Arapahoe, the bus driver waited for approximately ten minutes before there was a sufficient gap, and so that also drew concern from the RTD service planning because that affects the reliability and the timing. Uh, and, and uh, uh, the, the services. So we are proposing that that left turn lane be converted to a storage and acceleration lane for buses to be able to do a two-stage turn where they can turn into that and then merge into the eastbound through lane. Other items in the project. So we're showing the pedestrian crossing at, at the, uh, the, which matches up with the existing multi-use path. 
we're also showing uh, the potential shelters, and we're also showing a realigned driveway at the uh, on the east side of the, the street, second driveway south from Canyon Boulevard uh, to give greater separation between the buses, uh, bus gate and the vehicles going in and out of that driveway. So that's sort of the overall view of uh, where we're at with the, the project at present and what's uh, what we're recommending uh, that would be included in the seat. And um, the budget for this, as I noted, is coming from RTD as well as Dr. Cog and City of Boulder funds. And the reason we are conducting this seat for the project is because this is a really critical location that impacts a number of city um, goals, initiatives, and facilities. And so we wanna make sure that it's consistent with the, all of the transportation master plan and Boulder Valley comprehensive plan objectives and goals. And so this, the specific purpose of the, the SEEP is to assess potential environmental, social, and fiscal impacts against city plans and policies, uh, and then identify and refine the preferred concept. And then we'll be bringing it, like I said to you, uh, in the July meeting for a public hearing and formal recommendation. As we do on all of our SEEP efforts on capital improvement projects, we conduct a robust community engagement. And on the downtown Boulder Station, we have conducted virtual community info sessions. We've conducted site visits with the, the Center for People with Disabilities, which was particularly enlightening. Uh, also uh, provided station pop-ups with community connectors, uh, put out web page and questionnaire material and uh, neighborhood mailers and city social media. So next steps, we'll uh, come back in the July public hearing and then it will be a part of the city council call up on July 21st, uh, assuming that uh, we get a recommendation uh, from council, then we'll move into finalizing the design, the floodplain permit and working through our CDOT environmental and utility clearances so that we can get the design ready to go to construction and fall of 2023. So that's an update on the project and happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Any feedback or questions from Tab? I don't have any. <laughs> no one? Might be a first. Well, we, I can't let it go okay. without saying something, but. <laughs> go ahead, Tila. <laughs> um, I was, I was, very pleased to read about removing the, the left-hand turn lane when um, when turning bus conflicts um, made something have to change because I saw that there's a you know there's a bulb out there um, for pedestrians there is right of way we could have taken that back and so uh, you know for once we have lived up to our prioritization of the vulnerable road users and of the pedestrians there and decided we don't actually need all this. Um, capacity that we've, we've built in and assumed um, that we need for motor vehicles. So kudos to that. Um, I was surprised that we didn't do something different, but uh, never mind. I'm not a traffic engineer. But anyway, I, I noted that and I just want to applaud that because I thought that was one, one place where we had a choice to make and it was probably the cheapest choice to make anyway, but uh, it was the right thing to do. And so I'm glad to see it. Um, I'm curious whether there is currently an LPI across Canyon at 14th Street. I, I don't know one way or the other. Um, you know, it, it feels like these, these people who are getting on and off the bus there are likely going to want to be crossing Canyon and going more toward the downtown area. That's going to be a, a central place. And so they, the, the better and easier access we can make for them, um, you know, I would like to see. Um, so just curious if there's an LPI there and if not, that should be part of the plan, but um, I would like to see maybe something better <laughs> if we can think of it. I don't think there is at present, but uh, I have uh, consulted with our signal operations staff and that is something that we could implement uh, even with uh, the current signal and technology that's in place. Okay. And um, uh, furthermore, as I noted, the, uh, how enlightening the, the, the site visit was with the Center for People with Disabilities. One of the other elements that we plan to incorporate into the project uh, is additional pedestrian time. If the push button is held longer, that would activate a longer ped phase. Uh, and this is something we have in place today at Broadway and Alpine. And so we would look to incorporate that here. 
um, because we just re we really want to make sure people have sufficient uh, time to get across Canyon. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Garrett. If there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and move ahead an hour ahead of schedule to the update on State Highway 119. Hopefully the folks from Boulder County are here. Um, Natalie, do you want to make any introductions? So actually, Valerie is going to do a nice introduction when they're here. Unfortunately, they have another present presentation tonight. And Valerie, can you just give us a sense of what's going on? Yeah, thanks, Natalie. This is Valerie Watson, um, Transportation Planning Manager. Um, they they do have another engagement tonight. Um, we're going to try and see if they're able to join a little bit earlier than 830. Um, and may we propose that um, we move on to our next agenda items and um, return once they arrive? Sure. I think the next thing we have is the info item regarding the outdoor dining. Oh, Tila, do you have Tila. Yeah, I meant to do this before we moved on to the downtown station and seek uh, item, but should we try to pin down a date for the um, CIP bike tour and the um, the study session? Oh, Meredith. Meredith has ideas. Yes, I do have ideas. Thank you. <laughs> um, but thanks to everyone for doing two different surveys, I know it was confusing. Um, my proposal is um, doing the working session on Wednesday, June 22nd at, from, at uh, 2.30 to 4 p.m. and the bike tour on Monday, June 20th 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. However, um, that makes it a little difficult for Ryan because he has to do a bee in the morning. So he might have to meet up somewhere unless everyone wants to delay it a bit. I just have summer camp. I have to drop kids off at 9 a.m. I could catch up. So I'd, I'd propose 9.30, but um, I'm happy to meet up. I'm sure we could figure that out. So not a big deal. So I think so, that works for sorry. everyone I heard from. Sorry, I apologize for not catching this sooner. Um, Monday, June 20th is the city's observance of Juneteenth. And so um, I think it's probably best that we don't host the CIP bike tour that day. I'm, I'm very sorry to, <laughs> to throw that <laughs> in here. I should have such a it. last minute. Um, so we may need to go back to the drawing board on the bike tour. Huh. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, I'll look at it and send out the next most popular date. I okay. think everyone that responded could make it on the 21st, the, the following day. Yeah, although it was all during that week that everyone would be available. Oh, good, okay. Yeah, so maybe the 21st and 21. if we can bump it back a half hour for Ryan's purposes, as long as that works for everyone else. Be unless, unless that pinches, I mean, it, I can catch up. That's good. I don't, I'd rather me lose 30 minutes and everybody else, you know, a bunch of people lose 30 minutes, but yeah, I'm good on the 21st and whatever, either time is fine. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> And then are we still waiting for folks for 119 or? We are, we're, we have a few folks on, but um, a couple more we're waiting on to arrive to have the full team for presentation. Okay. Um, I'll, oh, um, sorry, there, here's the team what's happening. Okay, I see. Um, our first, Ms. Old, does anyone have anything regarding the outdoor dining? So we can start with that. Not hearing anything there. Uh, next up would be matters from staff. Is there anything, I see Jean 
potentially with a regional transportation update or Valerie, do you want to talk about the safety stop law? I think we can go in order um, if Gene's available okay. for the regional transportation update. I am. Um, <laughs> you caught me finishing dinner, so <laughs> if you guys are okay, I'm going to stay off camera. <laughs> no problem. All right. Um, my update is pretty quick this evening. Um, I wanted to share information about one of our pri priority regional corridors, and that's Colorado 7 which as we all know is East Arapaho in the city of Boulder. And I wanted to share a bit of good news. Um, so the city and county of Broomfield submitted a regional tip application um, for pre-construction of priority intersections and segments of the Colorado 7 corridor between Brighton and Boulder in the Dr. Cobb, Dr. Cog um, first call for regional projects. And the board approved that project um, last month. So what does that mean for us? It means that um, we will be advancing our preliminary engineering project, which is gonna be starting next year, into final design for the segment of East Arapaho between 20th and Foothills Parkway. And that's about $3 million worth of final design work that's being done with a local match contribution of Hold on a second, I had that information uh, in front of me a minute ago. Um, our local contribution was is, is $170,000. Um, so that's, that's really great news for us. And as I mentioned, we're gonna be starting preliminary engineering for the full corridor. Um, hopefully I would say either fourth quarter of this year or first quarter of next year, CDOT has selected a consulting team that's being led by HDR consultants, which we're um, very happy with and we are part of that selection process. And along with um, the preliminary engineering work for the entire extent of the corridor, we'll also be doing um, more preliminary engineering um, at a greater level of detail for the Arapaho and 30th Street protected intersection also beginning uh, likely spring of 2023. And um, that project is being funded fully by CDOT. Um, we're currently in the process of entering into an intergovernmental agreement to um, have the city of Boulder lead that project. So um, I just wanted to share progress. Um, I know it was a little bit out of order, but I wanted to start with the good news and that we were able to secure tip dollars um, for final design of much of East Arapaho. And I think like Garrett said earlier in the meeting, um, we're pretty happy when we're able to turn pennies and quarters into dollars. And I think this is an example of where we've been able to do that and um, move the East Arapaho vision concept into actual construction drawings. So happy to answer any questions you all might have. Thanks, Jean. Any questions from Tab? Not seeing any. Thanks, Valerie. Do you want to go ahead with the safety stop? Yeah, absolutely. You bring up a presentation real quick just to have some visuals. All right, thanks. Um, I'm Valerie Watson, Transportation Planning Manager, and tonight we wanted to give you a quick update on the city's messaging in response to the new state law that has changed how people riding bicycles and scooters can navigate intersections. Um, that's referred to as the safety stop. This new state law allows bicyclists and users of other low speed conveyances, as the law calls it, um, that's uh, low speed mobility devices like e-scooters, skateboards, um, allows those folks to um, treat a stop sign as a yield. Um, so that allows- uh, Valerie, I'm sorry, you're not sharing screens. Oh, thank you, Veronica. One moment. All right, how about now? That is perfect, thank you. 
So that allows folks to treat a stop sign as a yield. So a person riding a bicycle or e-scooter, they can proceed slowly through an intersection while yielding to others with the right of way. Um, so that's, you know, for example, drivers who arrived before the cyclist or um, pedestrians in the crosswalk. It also allows um, folks to treat a traffic signal as a stop sign. And that means coming to a full stop and only proceeding after yielding to others with right of way and when the intersection is clear. Intersections are where we see um, you know, concentration of interactions with other road users. Um, so there's that increased chance for crashes and conflicts for, for people bicycling. And um, this is called the safety stop because it makes intersections safer by allowing people on bikes and low speed conveyances to get out of this conflict area more quickly. If you're under the age of 15, um, you must be with a parent or guardian to perform a safety stop. And I'll also mention that um, this, this law, when it was still moving through um, the, the process, was supported by our Boulder City Council and local and state bike advocacy organizations. So we've developed some educational materials just to get the word out. Um, our focus initially is on conveying what has changed with the new law and how it impacts people bicycling and using other low speed mobility devices. You know, in other words, what does this mean for me as a bicyclist? Um, we've created an Instagram story um, that's been posted and it will be echoed on other platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And this um, Instagram story to start with uh, links to a more detailed blog post or web page. Um, and also on that, that web page, we've linked to a fantastic handout from Bicycle Colorado that has a lot of information on the safety stop, how to perform that maneuver safely, and, and even information on how to educate children. So here are some screen grabs of the content that we've published to date at the city of Boulder. On the right side is the Instagram story, which it links to more detail on the web page that I mentioned. And that web page, um, a snapshot of that is shown on the left. Um, we wanted to keep the messaging really straight to the point, clear and concise, and just answer the basic question directly, you know, what has changed for the average user? So you'll see we boiled it down to four panels in the Instagram story to ensure that the most immediately relevant information is conveyed and then link to the web page um, to expand further with more detail and, and link to resources. And a big thanks to our communications team and in-house graphic designer who collaborated with our transportation and mobility staff to get this information out. In terms of coordination with other departments and agencies, we've been working with Boulder Police Boulder Valley School District and Bicycle Colorado so far. With Boulder Police, we've met several times to coordinate with their communication staff, and they have already sent information internally um, to their internal audience, um, including patrol officers and those who interact with the public, uh, to sure, ensure that there's that awareness of the new law and connect their folks with additional information and resources, such as that Bicycle Colorado pamphlet, which is shown on the right side of the screen. Boulder Police are interested in discussing more um, how their communications team can support continuing public education in partnership with transportation and mobility um, as we see how users adapt to the new rules. With BVSD, we've shared our materials with them and they will be incorporating this into their overall bicycle education curriculum and we'll be discussing this more with them at our next regular coordination meeting that we have as staff. With Bicycle Colorado, we're really grateful to how quickly they created this wonderful comprehensive overview document or pamphlet. Um, and it has that full section I mentioned on how to discuss the safety stop um, with children under 15 and as a parent or legal guardian. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, we link to that on our web page and want to make sure that that's, um, that information is just a click away. We're also in touch with folks at Bicycle Colorado so we can continue to check in with them on, on what they're hearing from cities across the state and you know how folks are experiencing this new change. So here's our web address for that web page that has more information. Um, and um, we really appreciate the, the interest from TAB in this topic. Um, so feel free to share the Instagram story and cross-pollinate 
the other social media platforms that the city of Boulder um, eventually posts on. Um, and moving forward, you know, we're really going to be listening to what the response is um, to the messaging that we've put out um, and feedback we get from the community on the safety stop. Um, and any needs we're hearing, you know, we'd be interested in, in doing future communications and can continue to coordinate with all of our partners. Thanks, Valerie. So with that, I'll, I'll end the presentation. Thanks. I saw the, the Instagram stories, maybe, was it yesterday? Yesterday and today, um, I think maybe even a little bit on Friday. I think it's been um, posted a couple times, yes. Nice. Trini? Um, hi, Valerie. Well, thank you so much for that. And yeah, I think this is something amazing and wonderful that we have adopted as a state. But I, um, I have one concern. Um, I don't see any education geared toward motorists. And I think that is essential because as a cyclist, I feel a lot of like animosity sometimes. And I think that if motorists are not aware of this law and what it implies for them, they, they, this can just kind of make that gap even wider. So it's super important. Are you guys planning on doing anything to educate motorists regarding this new law? That's great feedback, Trini, and thank you so much. I appreciate your perspective on that. And, and that's something we've heard um, from a couple other folks too. Um, you know, I think we really started out initially just making sure we get the message out to the users who are directly affected. Um, and, um, but, you know, absolutely want to keep that in mind as we hear feedback um, across the board on how, you know, folks are adapting to this new law being in place. Um, and yeah, I definitely understand, um, you know, your, your perspective on, on wanting to have, um, you know, a broad communication to all road users. Um, thank you for that. And I would also suggest if this is possible to, to extend this to the driver's ed curriculum to, I know that Bicycle Colorado created this amazing, you know, bicycle driver friendly program, maybe they could add something there, because it's really, really important if people understand that that is something that a cyclist is allowed to do by law, I think their reaction is going to be a lot you know, and it won't be like, oh, well, he's getting to do that type of thing, you know, whereas we don't and it's not fair. And I don't know, I just believe that we should all follow the rules and, and we should all know the rules. And when they change, it's important to let people know. So there's no false expectations. But anyway, that's a great point. Um, we'll definitely be discussing that with our contacts at Bicycle Colorado. I know one thing that they um, have been emphasizing in their messaging is that right of way laws have not changed. You know, this doesn't change how um, road users must yield to one another um, in that way. And um, really just impacts um, how bicyclists and, and other low speed mobility device users interact at stop signs and signals. So, um, you know, I think that's definitely in line with the thinking that we've seen them put out um, and happy to raise that with them next time we, we speak. Thank you for that. You're welcome. But it does kind of affect motorists too, because they have to be aware that that is a possibility and be aware and looking around and just kind of looking out for us as other users of the road. But thank you. I won't take any more time. Thanks, Valerie. I just wanted to respond really quickly to, to something that you just said about um, that, that the, the yielding patterns and, and the right of way rules haven't changed. Um, because we discussed that when we were, you know, first trying to, to decide whether whether we were going to support um, this push or not. And my thinking had always been that, um, in general, if a driver's around and a cyclist around, they're, the driver's not going to notice any difference because we're still supposed to yield the same way. And since this has passed, and I've taken advantage of it, and I love it, um, I have realized that I didn't anticipate the one, one situation where drivers will see this behavior. And that is when we both pull up to a red light and the driver's expected to wait. And if I see that it's clear to go, then I proceed. And the driver will see that. And that will be a change in behavior that they see. And I think that that is um, something that I hadn't really envisioned 
um, before actually applying and behaving under the new law. And, I, and to the extent that you can bring that back to Bicycle Colorado, that this is, this is a situation where drivers will be exposed to a different behavior by bicyclists, um, not when there's a conflict between people approaching the intersection, but when people at an intersection behave differently when they go through it. Um, it's, it's worthwhile, and I, I would echo um, Trini's emphasis on trying to, to do driver education. I think that's true for almost all of our rules um, regarding interactions between drivers and more, more vulnerable users. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Tila. Thanks. Anything else on the safety stuff? Alex? May I? Um, I've been banking my time for this one. Um, so thank you, Valerie. This is uh, this is really exciting, and I'm um, so glad you picked this up. I, I know I'm one of the um, tab members who asked uh, for some consideration of this a couple of months ago, or whenever it was a month ago. Anyway, this is really great. I, I missed the Instagram story, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna check it out or the, or the posting. Um, and I'm grateful that you're taking you the city is taking this seriously. Um, and one thing I want to just suggest is really welcome the work on social media um, <clears throat> as we as a city are undertaking structural changes towards making multimodality work. Um, the city being out there and really engaging with the public, especially on the things that are not intuitive to motorists, uh, is, just, is just key to, to, making, you know, to making this all work and, and reduce conflict and stress and to, to drive the motion that we want. So kudos for, um, for pushing out on this. I just I feel like I haven't seen a lot from the city on social and just education. Maybe I haven't been looking in the right places, but um, I know the Twitter account was, I think it was closed or whatever. And I know there's staffing issues. So I just wanted to offer that. I think it's super exciting. Love, love where you're going with this. Um, so, and I hope that with Natalie and the team and, and, and I don't know if the shared services, how exactly works with wider city, but would love to see even more, more energy going into um, this kind of social media and public education. Um, and I think just on the point of like things that are not intuitive, I, I know this is a little bit of a tangent, but one of the reasons I, I totally agree with Trini and um, Tila about the need to educate motorists. Um, and I think it's like, it's not an overstatement to say that bicyclists are really kind of like othered from, from the perspective of, of most drivers. I mean, they're, it's a very minority share of, of people who are actually riding bike for transportation. It's really easy to pile on to cyclists and say, you know, they're, they're rude behavior or, or to see rude behavior and, you know, assume that it's everybody else. And the, the situation that, that Tila explained, like, you know, the stoplight, and we already have the situation where there's a, a cyclist, it's the minority user. And then now we're sort of saying, oh, go ahead, like, so just do this thing that people think is probably illegal. I think another one is, is also sort of just in general, when you have multiple, you have an intersection with, with, with stops, it's four way stop or three way stop. And you have lines, you have a lot of traffic coming up to it and the bicyclist comes up. I, I just think that's another one where there's a little bit of um, a chance for just kind of stress and friction. So um, in the future, as we, as we, you know, potentially have more resources and time to, to you know, build onto this further. I'd be very excited about, about that motorist engagement part two. Um, and again, it's like starting with safety stop, but then it's also some of these other things like why are we making the intersections skinnier and you know that, that sort of a thing. So um, I think that's all I have to say, uh, but this is great. Really, really love this. Thanks, Brian. I think that wraps that up. Are we still waiting for county folks or are they here? I think we have um, uh, the team members needed to, to begin the presentation so we can go ahead and get started. Awesome. Apologies for being an, an hour ahead of schedule. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Um, so I will give a little bit of, a, of an introduction just because we have um, folks from multiple agencies um, here tonight, which is very exciting. Um, you know, tonight we have the special presentation from the, this full project team for the Colorado 119 bus rapid transit bikeway and intersection improvements project. And this spans the diagonal from Boulder to Longmont. And with us tonight are Alexandra Phillips from Boulder County. Adnana Murtik from CDOT. I think we're also going to be joined by Ali Emansapahi from RTD and Stephen Humphrey from Muller Engineering, a consultant on the project. 
And this project came before you last in September of 2021, when the team presented on the concept plan for feedback. And tonight, the project is now in the preliminary design phase, and the team is looking for additional feedback across a wide range of stakeholders. So this evening, you will receive a quick overview of the materials that will be presented at an upcoming public meeting on June 27th, and the team will be available after their presentation tonight to answer any questions that you may have about the project design, the overall process, and upcoming public engagement and methods for providing feedback. So first, we'd like to invite the team to bring their presentation up on the screen and, and start with a quick round of introductions. So if I could ask each presenter, um, please tell us your name, the agency you represent, and your role on the project, and then we can get started. Um, if it's all right, I'll go first on the introductions because I also wanted to talk about the, the city and county's um, long-term collaborations. I'm Alexandra Phillips, the bike planner for the county. I'm also um, on the 119 bikeway team for the county. And we've just worked, um, there's been so much collaboration between the city and the county. There's a lot of times that our projects are outside of not even touching the city, but when they are, we've really had some successful projects, including um, the um, Williams, Williams Fork Trail, part of the Lobo Trail and the multi-use path over by 71st, which is two that just came to mind very quickly. And I've also presented to TAB before and worked with some of you on our Vision Zero um, meetings, which we will be starting again soon. And I just um, wanted to, to bring all that up before I pass it off to our other team members. And I will also bring up the presentation. So Adnana or Stephen, why don't you go ahead? I don't see a presentation, I'm sorry. I don't know if you're sharing. I'm bringing that up in just a second. I'm working on it. Okay. So Adnana, maybe um, just say a few words about your, your role on the team and, and CDOT's involvement and you know followed by your other team members. Definitely, thanks Valerie. Um, hi, uh, my name is Adnana Murtic. I'm with uh, CDOT, I'm a project manager for Colorado 119 uh, safety and mobility projects. And um, you'll have to excuse us. Uh, Ali uh, with RTD is driving. <laughs> we did not know that we were gonna go um, sooner. So I did let him know. So I'm, I'm hoping he will join us in the meantime. If not, I'll try to cover uh, RTD information. So again, um, thanks for having us uh, here tonight. And just, just sharing, uh, the updates on what's going on on uh, both projects, um, mobility, uh, safety and mobility improvements project and the bikeway project. And at the moment, uh, we are at the preliminary stages of uh, design and uh, wanna share that with you. And as we already mentioned, our public meeting is on the uh, June 27th and we will uh, provide more information as we get to the uh, final slide of this presentation. So again, um, why 119 and what are we doing to um, you know, uh, address challenges out there? So um, again, it's a safety and mobility project. And when it comes to safety, one of the uh, major challenges is that there are so many crashes and it's a basically highest crash corridor for motorists and the second highest for uh, bicycles in the corridor. And, as you can see on the left side of the screen, a number of crashes during a five year period of time is really high and includes uh, um, for goal. In this case, it's just by uh, implementing these improvements to uh, improve um, safety uh, in the corridor and definitely uh, reduce those crashes. And uh, we're expecting basically uh, based on our analysis that over a 20 year uh, time period, we're expecting about 370 uh, less crashes uh, after we implement all these improvements. Next slide, please. Again, uh, when it comes to uh, mobility challenges, uh, the, basically the corridor lacks um, safe and uh, direct way uh, for bicycle between Boulder and Longmont, and that's why bikeway project is 
definitely a very important component uh, for the corridor. And then uh, RTD is implementing uh, BRT uh, service to, to improve those uh, traveling times and uh, definitely help uh, with congestion reduction. And again, uh, implementing all uh, improvements uh, throughout the corridor and each intersection is going to help us um, that to, to reduce the congestion and delays and uh, crashes in the corridor. So uh, definitely um, looking forward to uh, all those uh, implementation as part of uh, this project. Next time, slide please. This uh, slide is, um, as I call it, a snapshot, a quick snapshot for uh, all, uh, all efforts that are happening in the corridor. And uh, what we are talking about tonight is really a part of um, 119 that we call the diagonal, uh, where our uh, southern pro uh, project limit is at the Foothills Parkway and the northern uh, project limit is at the uh, Hover Street. And just, just we will uh, get uh, into more detail in, in uh, next few slides, but just, just wanted to uh, bring your attention to all that's happening on each of the intersections, as well as uh, you know, in the median where uh, bikeway uh, is going to be located. Next slide, please. So I don't know if Ali is here. Ali, please speak up if you're here. Okay, so I will, <laughs> thank you. I was just informed that he's not gonna be able to he's join us. He's gonna call in in a few minutes. Oh, okay, okay. Great. Yeah. great, thank you. So uh, again, the, the vision for the Northwest Corridor is to connect um, Boulder, City of Boulder and City of Longman with reliable bus service. So the goal with BRT service is to uh, provide efficient um, traveling service that, and this, this BRT service that is planned for diagonal will basically replace both. And it will have uh, three bus stops, one in Niwot, one in uh, 52 and one in 63rd, as well as two parking rides in uh, Niwot and uh, 63rd. And you will um, see uh, some of the details of that design uh, soon as, as uh, in the next couple of slides. And then, um, basically, the, the goal, again, is to reduce congestion and provide reliable, faster and frequent service, uh, bus service in the corridor. And it is, it is expected to, uh, that the transit trips will be uh, shortened by nearly 50% in the corridor. Next slide, please. Uh, now, Stephen, uh, who is our uh, consultant working on both projects, is going to lead us through uh, the de details of um, a few intersections uh, that we're working on. Hey, Adnan and everyone, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. I apologize. I'm not sure if the camera's working or not. I'm in the car <laughs> parked on the side of the road, to be very clear. Um, <laughs> All right, uh, let's get let's talk about a few of the key intersections in the corridor. Um, I will say there's a lot to these various projects and a lot of collaboration that's going on. And we don't, although I guess now we might have time to go through more of the intersections, we didn't think we were going to have time to go through all of them. So we've got probably the three most critical um, from the, the standpoint of the city of Boulder. So we'll start on the southern end of the corridor at J Road. Uh, we'll take a look at that intersection, as you can see here on the screen. This is a really good example of the bus queue bypass lanes that we're going to have up and down the corridor at all the signalized intersections and how they're going to move the buses through the intersections more efficiently. So during peak hours, uh, when you see, you know, traffic building up at the various stoplights along 119, what's going to happen here, and you can kind of see it with the, the reddish pink uh, highlighted lanes, the buses in the corridor are going to have their own dedicated lane and priority. So they'll be able to move around the queue, move up to the front of the intersection, and then have priority to move through the intersection. Um, that's one of the, the bigger improvements in the corridor and also for the BRT service. And then you can see on the opposite side of the intersection, they're also going to have that acceleration lane so that they can get back up to speed safely and move over into uh, the general travel lanes. We're also going to have transit signal priority and other safety and operational improvements at these intersections. Uh, some examples of that would be 
upgraded signs, roadway striping, lighting, and signal pole upgrades. Um, you'll also see uh, at this point in J Road, it's the first example of one of the underpasses for the bikeway and um, some of the spur connections up to the street level, if you will. Um, but I, I guess another thing to highlight at this intersection and really all the intersections in the corridor is there is a plan for a broader vision of sort of first built pedestrian and bike connections in the corridor, um, some that exist today, others that will be created as part of the project. And then also we're reviewing those, those master plans, those first and final mile connections to understand what the future connections might look like. Maybe they won't all get constructed today, but we'll have a vision and a plan and, a, and an implementation for those connections uh, in the future. And then, um, you know, more to come as, as development and other things build out in certain areas. So that's all I have for J Road. Inanna, if you want to move on to or Alexandra to 63rd, please. Awesome. Um, so here we've got a lot going on. Um, you can pretty much see it from the screen. But here's a great example of um, a BRT station and a park and ride facility that's going to be constructed in the corridor. So today at 63rd, um, that parking lot doesn't exist. That'll be constructed as part of the project, uh, along with these two upgraded BRT stations. Um, and then, of course, there's going to be the Q bypass lanes we just kind of discussed at J Road. We're going to be implementing those same similar type bypass lanes at 63rd. And we'll have drainage and water quality and detention, other kinds of improvements associated with the parking lot. Um, the other thing you'll see here at 63rd is we're going to um, be reconfiguring 63rd Street between northbound 119 and southbound 119. We're going to be adding in a left turn lane uh, to accommodate access to that parking lot and then adjusting the overall configuration there, uh, bike lanes, the existing du dual lefts that head to southbound 119 and so on and so forth. Um, so that'll, that'll be another change you'll see at 63rd. And then we'll be doing a lot of the same or similar type safety and operational and pedestrian and bike access connections that we talked about at J Road. Uh, and then of course, here's another example of a bikeway underpass as well. And I think that's probably it for 63rd for now. And then the last intersection to take a look at here is Colorado 52. This from a roadway specific perspective is probably the most significant set of improvements happening in the corridor. Uh, I'm sure you all have driven 119 enough in those peak hours to see the backups and the queues at 52. Um, they're, they're some of the most substantial in the corridor. And so we completed a traffic, traffic analysis to evaluate operations in the corridor and come up with a way in which to reduce the queuing um, at 52 and, and corridor wide. And the recommendation out of that study was this split intersection you see here today. And it's a little bit hard to tell, but if you can kind of look in the background of this image, you'll see the existing intersection at 52 and 119, which is not separated. And it's just a little bit further to the Northeast than the proposed improvements there. And so our project would be splitting northbound from southbound and creating that divided highway scenario like you see up and down the rest of the corridor would be um, constructing the, <coughs> excuse me, the bus stations in this area, um, which I guess an added benefit of the, the intersections being separated is it creates that space in the median for the, the stations uh, like the rest of the corridor and then the bikeway underpass as well at this location. And now I can turn it over. I think Alexandra, were you going to walk through the, the bikeway slides? Awesome. Yep. So the bikeway is going to be running in the median um, from basically from the Pleasant View soccer fields all the way to Longmont. Um, connecting in to all the bike networks in Longmont, Boulder, Gun Barrel, Niawat. Um, it's, um, and that's one of the important things about this whole project, I think that is, we kind of overlook when we're talking on a countywide level, but it's actually gonna be connecting the city of Boulder to the city of Boulder. It's gonna be a really wonderful connection between Gun Barrel and the city of Boulder and the, the main part of the city of Boulder. The bikeway is gonna, going to be a separated paved year round facility, um, grade separated crossings, at major intersections, 
and with um, carefully planned at grade crossings at the other intersections. And it'll interact directly with the bus rapid transit. And um, so you can use the bikeway to do the entire nine mile corridor. You can ride it to connect to the bus rapid transit or to the communities along the way. And it's all one of the reasons that this project is actually possible is because it is in the median, which is CDOT owned, which means that we didn't have to spend 20 years trying to get right of way to build the bikeway. Um, the bikeway, um, there's, it's amazing how much water is actually out there. You don't think of that area as very wet, but there are going to be two bridge crossings, one at um, the, um, the Four Mile Canyon Creek Trail which is also gonna be in a major intersection of the bikeway. Actually, it's gonna intersect with that trail and another bridge um, over by Longmont by Left Hand Creek. You'll see where the underpasses are um, represented by the U, um, J Road, Niawat. Um, and there's also gonna be one closer to Longmont. And then this, the, um, I'm not calling them all out, Niawat 63rd. Um, and the street level crossings, including Airport Road. So here's the um, design. Um, this one is at 55th, but it's representative of all the other at grade crossings. Um, the crossing is in the middle of the road in the median. So the turning movements, the cars, the vehicles will have enough time to make the turn and then see the signage and see that they need to slow down or stop um, to cross. The green represents the, the sight lines. So that kind of gives you an idea of how much can be seen. It's um, based that the bikeway will be straight, not curving as it comes into the at-grade crossings for maximum visibility for the cyclists the pedestrians and the motorists, um, and also plenty of signage. Oh, and also the it will be a raised crossing at each one of those. Um, every time I do this presentation, I talk about all the raised crossings uh, in the city of Boulder along Broadway and it's in Table Mesa as an example. I'm sure you're all very familiar with those and how the raised crossings work. Um, and then most the underpasses will be um, um, 16 feet wide and 10 feet tall. Um, so plenty of room to get through them. Most of the actual bikeway will be 12 feet wide, except for at the areas that we're expecting a higher volume of use, both from the bicyc bicyclists and pedestrians and that through the station area, it'll be 16 feet wide. Um, I feel like there is one more thing I wanted to say on that. Oh, I guess, um, yeah, I think that's it. And we'll move on to this um, slide. Um, Adnana, did you want to take it from here? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Alexandra. So um, as I mentioned earlier, both projects, uh, the safety and mobility improvements project and bikeway uh, design project, uh, at, they're at the preliminary design uh, stage uh, design stage which is approximately 30 percent and uh, we're expecting to uh, have a final design sometimes in uh, summer of uh, 2023 and again i know i i keep talking about the public meeting but it, it's we're very excited about it and you know the first one that the joint public meeting is happening at the end of this month uh, and um However, in the meantime, we have been working with, or we are still working with uh, community advisory committee and equity advisory committee. And uh, we are really grateful for their uh, input and their time that they're uh, providing for uh, these two projects. So as uh, we're getting, uh, as we get closer to uh, construction, which we are expecting to uh, start in uh, beginning of 2024, we'll have another public meeting where, uh, and at that, that point, uh, we're hoping to, to have a better idea what kind of um, 
schedule we're expecting for uh, construction to start implementing all these uh, design elements from both projects, as well as how is that going to impact public and just basically prepare everybody for uh, what's to come. And um, I just I just want to um, say that we're really grateful for the coordination between CDOT, RTD, uh, Boulder County, City of Boulder, City of Longmont, and Commuting Solutions. I mean, it, it, it's been great, really a great experience, and 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 hoping for uh, more coordination and as we go uh, further into uh, this project. Next slide, please. And again, um, the, for a virtual community meeting, this is the link that um, uh, you can use for registration. And we would really like to invite you to be there and uh, provide your uh, feedback and input and, and participation. And um, I'm hoping that, you know, um, that we can answer your questions and we will uh, take them definitely into consideration and looking forward uh, for uh, future uh, coordination to improve uh, transportation uh, in uh, in our region and emails on the bottom of the screen are uh, probably the best way to reach out to us if you'd like to um, provide again questions or if you, if you if you need more information from us and I believe now we have the uh, whole team here Lee has joined us I was informed so uh, if you have questions now um, I, that that's it uh, when it comes to presentation. So uh, we uh, we can take your questions. Thank you, team. Anyone from Tab have some questions or feedback? Brian, Alex Adnan and team, thank you for this. I um, mean, Alex, I got the preview at the um, meeting. I forgot what it was called a couple of days ago at a, at a luncheon. So um, after that, I started telling I, County, who do I know that lives sort of near ish 119 and say, hey, you know what's happening? I should go to the meeting. But I, I found myself not really sure to tell them like why they should care, what, like, what, what, they, like, what they would do or say at the meeting. So I'm just curious if you could offer any thoughts on, um, you know, if you, if, if, you, if you, to the extent that you'd be interested in us, you know, recruiting folks to the meeting who live around there, probably, you know, ride bikes, be, be interested in the bus. What, and they haven't been to a transportation meeting before and this is like totally new to them. What, what, what to offer them to say, like, what input should they be thinking about giving? Um, why would they attend? Just so we can, I can help uh -huh. with the message. That's a really, really good question. Thank you for asking that. Well, first of all, to get them excited about it, this is gonna completely change the look and the safety of 119 um, and how we get between Boulder and Longmont and Gum Barrel and Niowat. Um, so that's kind of, it's gonna be completely different than what it is now. Um, and what, what we want them to do is look at it, look at the slides as we're presenting it, and it will also be on our website after the presentation, and to look at, well, how is this going to affect my commute, either by bike, um, as a pedestrian, or driving, or usually a mix of everything, and transit, and how will this affect my commute, and is this going to work for me, and what about the connection from onto the, the, bike, the bus rapid transit, does this make sense to me? Is this gonna work for me? This is the ideal time to give that kind of comments. We're in the preliminary design phase. So it's kind of all come together a little more real than the concept design that we came to you in about a year ago. But next time that we come to you, it'll be the final design and it'll be much harder to make changes. So when people look at it and say, how will this affect how I'm getting around on 119? The details of that. Um, that's that's really good input. And if Ednana and Stephen and Ali have anything to add to that, or actually Stacy, I saw her in the background, um, on what people should be um, thinking about for their comments. I just want to add, Alexander, you made a great point about uh, having an input now versus later and later meaning that year that I was talking about, it's, it would definitely be great to spread the word and have people participate in, in public meeting and, and any other, you know, we will have, I believe two weeks after the meeting, uh, we will have time to uh, provide input and ask questions and, and share your thoughts with us. So definitely that is welcome anytime to, um, 
just just give us an idea of what would work uh, for public and, and people who, who will be using this corridor after all for their commute. I was just going to throw out a couple things. Um, one, you know, the folks that do live near this corridor and utilize it today have invaluable information about, you know, things they've experienced, the way an intersection may function today, some of the concerns they may have seen. Um, you know, you like to think that when you get traffic information or data or counts or incident data or whatever it might be that you're, you're you're getting the full story. That's not always true. It's always good to get feedback from folks on what they're experiencing on the corridor today. So I will just throw that out there and that can help inform some of the design as we move forward. And then thinking a little bit more to the future, um, this BRT application and having the Q bypass lanes in the median, having the stations in the median, kind of the general configuration up and down the corridor is I'm not going to say the first of its kind, but I'm certainly going to say unique, and it's not a typical application of a BRT system. And so I think as we move forward with this project, it's going to be really good to get folks involved. And really, we need feedback on how do we provide proper signage and how do we provide education and outreach and how do we get the word out there, not only about the project, but how the, the in condition is going to function and how people will move up and down the corridor because it's going to be a bit unique. Thank you, Trini. Oh, well, I just wanted to say thank you because this is very, very much needed. Um, I love to ride <laughs> on the bike paths and I, when I, I'm in that area, I often just like, I fear because I have to obviously go on the road for certain sections. And, and I know a lot of people that will benefit from from this project and well, thank you so much. That's my two cents. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, I'm also excited about the, the long bicycle connections that this will provide um, between cities uh, and then also as access to transit. And I was wondering, I think we saw some bike lanes depicted on J Road and 63rd that cross the diagonal. Are those gonna be on-street facilities or are those gonna be protected? Um, the bike lanes, uh, oops, I did I just stop screen sharing? Feel black. <laughs> okay, the, the bike lanes on J or mm -hmm. um, most of them are going to be with a with a painted buffer. Is that what you're asking? I'm sorry. I... Yeah, asking about J and 63rd where there are a lot of vehicles moving mm -hmm. rather quickly and trying to, ex I think it'd be great if we could expand the, the low stress nature of the, the multi-use path, which will connect the cities. If the facilities that also tie into that and mm -hmm. are used to access the, par the park and ride stations, or even just people trying to cross the diagonal uh, on rides through more rural areas, I think um, best practices would indicate something a little bit greater than a buffer on yeah. those roads like J and 63rd. Mm -hmm. Yes, and 63rd already has um, a path on one side. Um, the, this, the scope of this project can only do so much in one time, but we are looking and we're um, working with um, all of our partners on how it will all connect. But I think right now, um, the um, on 63rd, it's going to be just bike lanes and on J will be bike lanes at the, at the moment. But is once there, you cross in, oh, I'm sorry, Stephen, yes? Oh, I, yeah, I'm agree, agreeing with you. I just wondered if there was any way to pull back up that exhibit really fast, sorry. Yeah, I don't know what happened here. I'll, I will do that. Um, the, the point I was gonna try to make, but it's really hard to see without a visual is mm -hmm. we, are, we are designing the turn lanes at those intersections so that they could function with you know, future bike or future paths on both sides of the intersection in addition to the bike lane, sort of creating that option for folks to be able to ride in the bike lane if they want to or have that option to hop onto the path through the intersection, but we're not building them everywhere exactly to Alexander's point but we're certainly keeping those future connection points in mind. If that makes sense. Yeah, I just wonder why we wouldn't try to, are we, it seems like there's not a right-of-way constraint in here. 
why we couldn't build the road just a couple of feet wider and and insert a, a concrete curb um, wherever wherever possible on the cross streets. Yeah, and in the case of J Road, we're we're not really expanding the footprint of the existing pavement there with the construction of J. Now at 63rd and at 52, those are more large scale improvements to the intersection. Um, but certainly something to take into consideration. You know, we're at, we're reconfiguring that and adding that left turn lane for the the parking lot here. Um, but like a J Road, we're just utilizing the existing intersections and expanding for the Q bypass lanes. If that makes sense. Okay, yeah, it makes sense that in some places we're not widening, but in the places we are, I think that'd be a good consideration. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just, and yeah. actually, oh, if, um, if I may just interject now that we do have the slides, sorry about that little hiccup there. Um, there, it does look there, once you, if you're crossing from 63rd, you can get on the, um, this path as well um, on this side and be able, so if you're coming, um, Towards Gun Barrel, towards Boulder on 63rd, you can you can bypass um, some of the on on road bikeway. I mean on road bike lane. Yeah, and this is a great example. Of what I was trying to get at is that we only have that on the one side, but then if you look at those right turn lanes on the other side of the intersections, we've set that up such that you could have a similar condition on both sides of the intersection in the future if you got to a point where that was warranted. I just wanted to second what Alex was saying, because I think if you guys are going to invest from the very, very get go, I think um, J and 63rd are problem intersections or problem streets. I think there's been multiple fatalities there from cyclists. There's a lot of cyclist um, traffic that moves along, especially J Road. So I think it would be in important to take that into account. So we wouldn't have to go back and kind of fix it, but to build it, you know, from the very start. Um, so if possible, maybe, maybe involve Vision Zero. Um, as... Thank you for those comments. Brian. Thanks. So we're looking at the, this is the proposed right, right now on the screen. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Do you have the, the current by chance just for like a quick uh, comparison? No, it's fine if you don't. Um, not, not as much here at 63rd and J right. and, and, and maybe if I could get at what you're getting at, we we're showing a bit more of the existing roadway that's going to remain in place at 63rd and J with the, these exhibits. Um, just because we we're trying to highlight how, how, you know, the bypass lanes and some of these other things will function. The big reconstruction as far as a change of condition from what exists today to the future is at 52. Um, what, what you'll be looking at here is some, at 63rd would be more pavement widening to the middle, and then obviously construction of the parking lot and maybe some of the adjustments between the two intersections, but it's not a full scale reconstruction of 119. Thanks. So I had a kind of close to close um, to what I was thinking about. I was um, trying to imagine I had a birthday party out on 63rd that I took my six year old on our bike to a couple of weeks ago. And I was I came up 63rd going north across this. It was super scary. And I don't it's not normally I mean, partly because I didn't know what I was getting into. And I was, but anyway, we ended up it was on the I guess the, the west side of the road um, closer to the, 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 the parking the parking area. And then as you get I got to the um, the north, the north section of 118, I just kept going. And then I got out on that triangular island and I was like, what do I do? And I went and, it, and then I was on the super scary narrow shoulder. And um, I suppose I'm just wondering, it's just a comment that as you go about this, um, I'm just wondering how that design is, that's sort of getting people to consider to go north on 63rd, to get them on the right side of 63rd where there is the path. Cause I didn't know it until I was on the other side. So. Just, just a comment <laughs> to give that give that pathway some consideration of people going trying to come from Boulder to go north to 63rd where you you know could go to Boulder Reservoir or otherwise. No, it's a it's a really good comment and it's sort of that comprehensive look of we don't just we can't just build the path and consider it call it good and call it a day. We need to be looking at you know signage and notifications and and just you know how do we how do we 
make this as, as functional and, and as um, um, straightforward for folks so they, they kind of know how to, to get through the intersection. I think you know, there's a lot that can be done. I also think all the activity at the park and ride station will, will help to draw people in and, and uh, you know, help to sort of keep people you know, in certain areas where they might be more comfortable. But it's a really good comment and, and overall something we just need to take into consideration as we move forward with final design and not just put in a path and call it a day. Tila. Thank you. I was like waving my hands wildly, not realizing I was not on camera. So, <laughs> um, couple of questions. So, the last time I recall us talking and looking at this, we spent quite a lot of time um, thinking about where and how the at the southern end of this pathway it plugs in and crosses Four Mile Creek. And I'm just curious what uh, if any decisions have been made or what what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. in that area because that's not something we've talked about yet this evening yes and the reason we haven't talked about it is those decisions have pretty much been made because we did spend so much time talking about it last time and getting input from both um transportation advisory boards from longmont and boulder and in the public meetings and we're essentially um i don't have the slide in front of me i can email that to you later i would love we, it thank you we are going with what tab recommended Okay, I'm um, remind me what that was. <laughs> <laughs> it ties, it was more of the original concept plan. Stacy, if you can help me out, where it ties more into um, the north side instead of um, tying more into the um, where the Foothills okay, okay. Bikeway is, it okay, ties okay. in more to the, the north of this Pleasant View soccer field. Right, um, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I also was wondering what uh, what kind of thinking and planning is going into um, lighting considerations for users mm -hmm. of this bikeway. Um, you know, I'm a, I don't really commute that much anymore, but when I was a regular commuter, I would always get thrown when we moved to daylight savings time and I didn't have my headlight charge or I didn't, you know, it would, it would always be, and it's not as efficient in the cold weather. It's always a concern, especially at the beginning of the winter um when it's still perfectly rideable but the daylight is less predictable uh and it, you can get kind of caught unawares and it makes it for a very uh discouraging um experience if you're on a dedicated bikeway like, like this where you're expecting to do a long haul and suddenly you're in the dark so curious what uh because i know europe does a lot of this and they have similar weather events and um, they, they are much more successful than we are in encouraging year round commutes on this kind of beautiful dedicated bikeway. And so I'm curious what thinking has happened about lighting. We've spent a lot of time looking at underpass lighting. Um, all the underpasses will be lit. They'll also mm -hmm. be lit during the day um, because sometimes on a very bright sunny day, you actually have kind of the opposite where you get into, you know, as right. opposed to being in the evening where it'll be black and you won't be able to see it it'll just because of the the light differential so it'll be lit as during the day as well okay but that's seven spots along a nine mile mm -hmm. corridor so i'm actually asking more about along the entire corridor mm -hmm. um at this time i don't think that we're looking at lighting the entire corridor i um steven or um stacy i don't know if you can add to that yeah, I don't know if I can speak to lighting of the, of the rest of the bikeway. I can say that we're, you know, looking into the lighting for the, the parking lots, the stations and the intersections at large. And it's kind of the same concept, right? If you don't have lighting all the way up and down the corridor, which 119 doesn't, you're going to have sort of a transition into a lighted area at each of the intersections. And then you'll probably have even higher lighting levels at the BRT stations and at the parking lot. Um, so from like an overall site plan perspective, I can say that the, the five intersections are going to have, you know, some measure of lighting from a safety and operational perspective for the, the highway corridor um, that that could uh, could help to a certain extent, but I don't I don't know about the rest of the bikeway. Okay. I think um, if I can add to that, I, I totally understand about um, thinking about you need to charge your lights, all that but it is something that as a cyclist, we do need to be aware of the, of the change in the light and be prepared for that. We also don't wanna overlight anything, um, being aware of the environmental concerns around that as well and the ongoing maintenance costs. But as cyclists, we 
um, and I, I know sometimes I've been like, oh no, what am I going to do now? My, my headlamp just died. So I get that, but that is something that we'll, we'll need to be aware of. Okay. Similar question on snow removal. Mm -hmm. What can, what can it, users expect on snow removal on this path? We'll expect ex pretty much exactly the way it works on the US 36 bikeway, which is contracted out at mm -hmm. this time, but um, the contract says that it's plowed by 6 a.m., depending on the snow level. And if there are concerns, so is it does that work for you? But we are having, it is going to be paved in a way that will be usable for bike commuters, which means that it's going to be paved very early in the morning. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, is this fully funded? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> the, the short answer to that is no. Um, thank you to um, the city of Boulder for writing letters of support for our TIP grants and our RAISE grants. It's a um, very complicated, interchangeable thing that we're looking at all different grants. But um, basically, um, the, the design is fully funded. The construction is partly funded. Okay. And I don't know if Stacy wants to add anything else to that. Stacy is our grant mastermind. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, you know, we're all working collaboratively amongst all the project teams to identify additional funding. And as you saw in the kind of construction schedule, we're, you know, we'll build what we have funding for when we have that in that first phase. And then if um, in, 20, you know, starting in 2024, and then, um, you know, it might, there might be some other things that need to be added in, in subsequent phases, um, but that's, um, we're still working hard on it. We haven't given up yet <laughs> and, and we're hoping we can have um, most of this funded by the time we're ready for construction, so. Okay, good to know. Um, I think my last question or comment, um, I, by the way, I'm super excited about this. I think it's a long time coming. I'm very, very pleased to see um, the progress so far, um, partly because it's uh, elevating um, and prioritizing this mode of travel as a legitimate transportation option for people commuting longer distances and using it longer distances. And in that regard, um, I think the one big complaint I have at, for instance, at 63rd, um, is the signal timing for slower moving vehicles, mostly bicycles, to just cross the diagonal <laughs> um, is clearly geared toward, um, it's, it's clearly not optimized for slower moving vehicles. So routinely, unless you hit it just right, already rolling at a pretty good clip, you're not gonna make it across both of those legs um, of, of uh, 119. And I would think that when you're adding in users and parkers in the middle, um, would be an opportune time to reset sort of the expectations um, about signal timing um, to accommodate slower moving vehicles, motor vehicles turning into a parking lot and slower moving bikes and e-bikes, um, both along 119, but also crossing 119 because it is clear that the priorities um, for people moving across 119 and trying to get from one side to the next um, is not geared towards cyclists now. And this is, I think, an opportunity um, to capitalize on some change and to make some real changes that help slower moving, more vulnerable road users get across better. So I just wanted to invite you uh, to capitalize on this opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Tila. Anything else from Tab? wanted to mention that we do have Ollie and Natalie from RTD on right now. So if there's any transit questions, this is um, a time to ask them. I saw this will lead to an estimated 33% increase in transit and we're going to a couple routes with 50, 30 minute or better headways. Uh, what's the current service and ridership? on this corridor with the bolts or other services. Good evening, it's Natalie. Currently, well, it depends on which one we're looking at. Currently for May, summer, the um, frequency on the bolt is hourly. 
we will go back to 30 minutes in the AM and PM peak and hourly in midday because the ridership right now is only a couple of hundred a day. Now projected as you see was 2,250. We'll have to see if that's gonna transpire because travel patterns and demand has changed significantly with COVID. So we're actually monitoring. We have a survey out with CU right now um, that is very specific to the corridor of uh, uh, staff employees at CU to get feedback from them directly as to how they would use this route, both patterns, uh, when, what their destinations would be, they, where they would get on, where they would get off, that type of stuff. So we're gonna use that as a starter. We are looking to start phasing come January 2023 run board for service change, but that all depends on our resources. As you know, we have a significant operator shortage and uh, depending on what the resources are, we might be able to add service, we might not. So all fingers crossed, hopefully we can. When we do that, we would go, the phasing would start with 30 minute AM PM peak and then um, 60 in midday. It's simply because right now the demand just wouldn't warrant it. Um, it would be a waste of, of resources. So efficiency and it's tax dollars. <laughs> have to make sure we spend them wisely. Um, we, if we overlay the orange pattern and that's part of why we're doing the survey to see very specifically where and, and how people would use the pattern. So for starters for phasing, it might only be a couple of trips, two, three trips in each direction in the M and in the PM. And then as things progress, um, we would add trips and expand the service. Thank you, that's very informative. Anything else from Tab? If not, thank you for the whole team coming out and joining us tonight and looking forward to seeing the, the final designs whenever those might be ready. And thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Next up, we'll switch back to matters. Um, Natalie, was there, were there any other matters from staff? No, I think we're good. Thanks, Alex. Okay, next up, matters from the board. First, um, the tab retreat debrief. I'll start by mentioning that Natalie and I followed up after the retreat and tried to figure out how we want to follow up with regard to TAB members being able to share um, the, our various priorities and try to come up with some reasonable priorities that we can, we can hopefully help support staff with um, in their efforts. And we threw out the idea of, of using the fourth Monday of this month as a potential meeting date to continue that discussion, but the facilitator wasn't available. So if this is a, an approach that a majority of the board would like to follow um, up with, then we can go ahead and try to find a, a, a time that'll work for everyone with a, a doodle pull or whatever. Sorry, Alex, I'm not quite clear on what you're asking. At the retreat, we didn't quite get through our agenda with yep. one of the very important things being TAB members being able to bring forward some of their goals or priorities and us having a conversation where we can hopefully formalize a, a few of those um, and give us something to, to work for um, over the course of the year. And it seemed like something that would be difficult to do late at night under matters from the right. board. So <laughs> now they had suggested that we, we schedule a, a part two to the retreat where we where we tackle that item okay and i felt that was like that was a good approach versus trying to do it not do it or um do it during a, an already scheduled meeting right agreed um i'm out all of july so <laughs> you could do it in july you know we don't necessarily all have to be here i don't know what becky's um, availability is but and then once we're getting to august then we are a good you know four months past our usual um, retreat time. So I'm just throwing that out there. We, we, we slog along every year, people individually bringing things um, willy nilly anyway, whether we've agreed on them at the, at the retreat or not, but it wouldn't be bad to have better structure. So I support that. Mm, right. So I am of two minds. I, my, my first 
immediate mind when you when you raised it was like, well, how you know, we already have too much to do and and staff has too much. To, how are we how are we gonna add more onto that? So it's sort of an agreement with Tila said. But on the other hand, I think one reason that we're susceptible to willy-nilly things happening a lot is because I don't think we have a, a, a shared sense of principles about like, Alex, why are you here? Teal, why are you, I mean, individually one-on-one, -on -one, but it's not like as a team, we've had, a, we, we've gone through the exercise of doing kind of a whiteboard to say like, oh, it turns out that four of us like really, really care about these two or three things. And it's not in my mind so much like a particular measure or an item, but it's more just like, strategic priority kind of level. Maybe I'm bringing way too much like consultant kind of <laughs> mumbo jumbo to this, but to me, it feels like that's one of the, that's one of the missing elements that causes us to be kind of in a lot of places. On the other hand, I'm not gonna argue that we have to do it at this point, because like you said, people are out for the summer and the fall. If folks or other people are interested to do it, I would, I would love to make time myself, but um, you know, I, I can live without it. Yeah, and we've had a lot of those conversations that I, I think would be productive to have at a, a board-wide level if, if possible. But um, Natalie? Yeah, I was just going to offer like a thought. I mean, I, you and Alex, you and I talked about this. Um, and I think, you know, recognizing that, Tila, you're going to be out all of July. And um, I mean, I think, you know, people, it, it makes sense. People are going to have travel this summer. But I, I don't think necessarily... It needs to not happen just because it would potentially wait until August. Um, because I think one of the things just to keep in mind is that, you know, as Tab talks about their priorities, it's to um, be able to have a conversation or or um, share your thoughts with council, right, in affecting our our work plan. Because anything that comes out of it isn't going to change our 2022 work plan, right? Like, it may. Um, offer thoughts on our 2022 work plan, but it's not going to add anything to it. And so I think it, it still would be useful for you all to have that conversation, just as Ryan has said, like to give the opportunity for you guys as a team to think strategically about what your priorities are and then how you affect that in a conversation with council or in your council letter, or however that kind of that venue occurs um, so that you have had a chance to do that in a you know, open meeting and um, instead of having to, you know, I know you guys usually do like the one-on-one -on -one emails, um, but to be able to offer that space for that. And, and also, you know, to have um, myself or somebody from staff there to be able to answer questions. Just a thought, but. Thanks, Natalie. I mm -hmm. agree. And I, I think like uh, Ryan and Becky have four more years working together. So um, having a, we might be four months into this uh, board year, but it, there's still plenty of time ahead for, for those conversations to happen. I just so, wanted to say that I agree, mm -hmm. Alex. I think it would be a great idea for us to be able to do this um, and just have this conversation. Thanks. So I guess we should all expect a scheduling pull from Meredith maybe in the coming weeks and we can try to get this scheduled maybe early August when Tim is back. Can I offer one just thought on that? Um, I, I think that it's a really good point that some of us have, I mean, yeah, the, our two newer colleagues are very new. So I would rather wait a month and get all five than like do it sooner and get four. I know that things can still come up. And so that, you know, but um, we're just, we're only five. So if we're missing 20%, <laughs> that's a big part of it. So yeah, okay, I think we'll we'll this. This, if we can make it happen, yeah. It'll give us plenty of time still ahead of our annual letter to council end of the year or beginning of next. So look out for phase two. Any uh, of the retreat, any debrief needed on the first part that we had with a couple weeks ago? Okay. Not seeing any um, open board comment. I know Ryan, you're, you've expressed an interest in talking about e-bike subsidy. I had two items and a, and a, and a short bonus one. I, this is the time when my kids just come. Anyway, there's a kid that came in and ran away. I may have to. Does anybody else want to go first? I can go, but if anybody else wants to go first, it might give me a minute to buffer. Uh, naked, naked yelling kid. 
<laughs> I don't think I have anything turning uh, Happy to oh, hear there. There she is. Well, I, I I did have one question um, under matters for the board. There was, I think, a conversation that we were going to schedule the workshop, the um, CIP workshop. And I wasn't sure, was there still an interest in having the workshop? I just wanted to open that up for kind of discussion. And the it CIP have workshop? To the CIP workshop, yes, sorry. I feel remarkably well informed this year on CIP stuff. Um, before, when we had done it a couple of years before, when, you know, when this kind of started up, it was because there were, I don't know, there were lots more projects happening, <laughs> lots more choices. We didn't know the background on a lot of them. Um, so I'm not, I'm not feeling as under-informed as I was previously, where we felt we needed to have an extra study session. Um, that being said, every time we've had a study session, I've learned something and it's been interesting. So I'm not opposed to it, but I don't feel the need for it the same way I did in previous years. Anyone else? I feel relatively informed and don't foresee any bringing forward any major suggestions to right. to change what we saw tonight. So um, I would I think I would be okay without doing a, an in depth session on this. I think it might be most useful for our newer members. Um, of whom only one is here at the moment, but I'm not feeling an urgent need. I guess we, we could talk to Becky and we could do something together if she's available. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm available <laughs> to you guys. Um, yeah. So there's always the option, you know, um, and I don't want to, I don't want to <laughs> offer Garrett up, but I, I think, you know, he was You're prepared to do the workshop and he certainly um, could provide, you know, if, if Trini, you and Becca wanted to, or Becky wanted to um, meet with him to get more information just for that additional, since you're new, um, you know, I, I think Garrett, would that be something that that, and that is, in fact, something we've done in years past is uh, just done the workshop with a couple of the newer members. So that would be fine with me. OK, well, just let me know. Um, yeah, we, we can just double check with Becky what her availability right. may be. But um, but yeah. OK, yeah. And we can feel free to just reach out to me, Trini, and we can sort it out via email. And Meredith can help find a date if we need to do that. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay, thanks. Brian, things under control. Brian, yes, as in control as we're going to be. Um, okay, so <laughs> I, I have one one main thing, and then a couple of uh, small things. I'll, I'll try to be fast, but I, I guess we have a little bit of time. But I don't, I don't want to. Anyway, I'll try to be brief. So the first, the main thing is I wanted to just um, introduce the here in this docket uh, the e bike idea of e bikes incentives and the prospects for Boulder, uh, and I've sent a couple of emails to Tab colleagues about this and like I said I just wanted to bring it bring it to discussion here um, so we all have can do this together and uh, just a, a couple of points of background and then I'll, I'll say what I think is the point um, so a few a few things with background one it you know this is like dial it back but just just so we have like, I guess an evidentiary record if we need it it's pretty clear I think that e-bikes are a technology that can really extend utility of bicycles uh, for mode shifting Debate, argue about that if we need to, but I, I'll just assume people, I think, agree with that. Um, let's talk about it if we have to. Um, the second one is that giving more e-bikes, putting more e-bikes into the homes of more people in Boulder could be a great way to increase mode shifting for us. Uh, and then a second order basis to build the culture community of cyclists in our town. So e-bikes would be a great a great thing to, to invest in. Um, and a few months ago, Sue Prant from Community Cycles had reached out to TAB about this. Uh, she pointed out uh, some ideas for funding. Um, and since that time, Denver has launched its e-bike program, which sold out very quickly. Uh, and it seems like something that's that's go in going in the right direction and something the Boulder in principle could, could build usefully build from. Um, so that's the background. Um, as far as where we are now, I've had a few exploratory formal discussions with um, 
senior members of staff and also city council um, on, on really like the main question of is this possible in terms of paying for it? I mean, could this, is this something we could do? Um, and it seems like there, there is some burgeoning interest um, just sort of around on this. Um, one of the big questions is timing. Uh, in particular, would there be a practical way to request or secure funds for a program to launch as early as 2022 as a as a kind of a pilot, um, given that the, the, the budgeting is quite advanced already for, for, um, for going forward, um, and also just given the department's immediate capacity. Uh, so in hearing from TAB members individually, I've heard from each of you, and um, I would characterize what I've heard is there's at least a majority of, of interest in this. Um, and also one TAB member very studiously said, um, maybe, but it's you know more council's job to be telling staff um, to do new things than it is than it is ours. Um, and so what I wanted to offer is just to, to kind of uh, propose that we informally uh, either just give our support to staff and council as this something as this is something that they would potentially consider or as they might potentially consider. Um, and just offer any advice, you know, as they go forward, if, if we have any, um, but not to do anything more formal than that, uh, rather just to, you know, make it clear that we, you know, think there's a, a logical basis for a program like this, um, or if there are any concerns or, or thoughts, you know, going in any different directions, this might be, be a good time for it. So that's, that's, that's what I'd like to propose. We could do this pretty fast, probably just going around the table, unless folks have elaborate opinions, then I'm, I'm, I'm guessing people don't, but I'll leave it at that. We can go popcorn style because you each need to. I'd love to hear from each of you. <laughs> um, Tila, do you want to go first? Well, I think you. Um, thanks, Ryan, for uh, for for bulldogging this. Actually, <laughs> um, I think you uh, encapsulated our comments pretty well. What you've um, proposed seems unobjectionable. But I'm not sure it would gain a whole lot of traction. Um, but what I think is important about what you've been doing in the last month is that you've actually done a lot of the, the outreach to the people who would have to be doing some of the lifting um, and that they seem at least amenable to it. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm the one who said like, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, you're supposed to advise staff and council, but this, this is kind of unsolicited advice. <laughs> But to the extent that you convince them that maybe they should be doing some soliciting of advice and ideas, um, great job. Thank you for, for doing that and for hanging on to this. Um, and I, I'm comfortable with your proposal that you set out. Thanks, Alex. Can I call on people? I know that's not how we normally do it. But... <laughs> go, go ahead, Trini. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, that this is like a no brainer suggestion to, in my opinion, I mean, given in the last meeting, didn't our bike share friends share that the increase in riding for their fleet of bikes increased by like 60% when they changed switched over to e bikes, it was like some dramatic increase in ridership. And so I think anything that we could do to get more e-bikes on our roads and you know support that. I think that would be a game changer for a lot of people. So yay, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, Ryan, thanks for taking the lead on this. I think the conversations with council are really important to figure out what amount of support there is there. And then I think it's, I'd be curious to hear from staff about how they see their role in this and and have them help set the expectations, especially for timeline, because unless there's some other body facilitating a program like Denver has, um, it'll it'll come down to them. Thanks. And maybe maybe we could yeah, if the staff has anything to say. But first, just uh, for Becky, since she's not here, I'll just share that her email response was generally positive. She had a you know a couple of design considerations questions, but um, I suppose with that, you know, we have, I guess I, I'm not really sure that I explicitly said what I thought, but I mean, I just, I would just say for my part, um, yes, if, to the extent that we have staff capacity uh, and the funding secured, uh, or the, that we can make a case for this kind of funding and, and secure it, um, 
it would be very positive for Boulder to develop an e-bike incentives program for a bunch of first principle reasons to support our public goals, be good use of public money. Um, it would uh, create a lot of joy in this community. That would be great for us. And um, I'd be willing to provide advisory or other support for that is needed. I, I suspect those here would. So I think with that, we could say that informally, you know, unanimously TAB thinks it's a positive idea, you know, provided there was sufficient resources to pay for it. So that's all I really wanted to do as far as just making that clear, but I would love you. Yeah, I don't know if Natalie, I don't want to put anybody in the spot, but if Natalie or others want to just weigh in on this with your thoughts, questions, concerns, that you're, you know, that you're able to share at this point, I realize maybe there's not much to say. Yeah, I can share just um, what we, the conversation we had at CAC this morning, um, council asked or CAC asked that we um, come to the June 21st meeting to um, basically present kind of what it would take to do a pilot, what the trade-offs in our current work plan would be and um, what the budget need would be. Um, and then we'll also talk about what a 2023, um, kind of our initial thoughts on what a 2023 uh, program would look like. We are definitely supportive of exploring a 2023 program. Um, the, the idea of a pilot in 2022 certainly will just require um, trade-offs to our work plan and budget um, consideration. So we're going to have more information to present to council on June 21st at their meeting. Great. So hopefully that's helpful. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Alex, I, I, we might be good on this unless anybody else is dying to say anything. Okay, I'm going to keep mm -hmm. moving. Mm -hmm. I have two, I had two other quick things just in response to things we've heard from the community. Uh, so first, uh, Kurt, I was, I was taken with um, Kurt's discussion today about the CU Conference Center at Broadway and Grandview. And I think his um, just direct suggestion with community cycles makes a lot of sense to me just in terms of explicitly saying. But I also felt like I wanted to raise this because there's kind of a second order thing. And um, was, was he was describing how, you know, there's an impression that the consultants didn't just like, didn't really look at this very carefully. Uh, the matter of pedestrian uh, and bike safety and convenience. Um, it just, it's, it's, I find it distressing because if I, if I look at this from a, a climate action perspective, um, IPCC says that compact development is a necessary condition for decarbonization. And the, and the whole premise, I mean, largely of, of that, of compact development for decarbonization is that we will have a way to practically decouple people from cars um, and make it more multimodal. Um, and when I go to bat for <laughs> expansion to see you south, I have the, this is this to me, this is one of the, the main reasons. It's it's in the name of compact development so that we can build safe multimodal streets. Um, but compact development on its own doesn't do it. We need we need willing and excited partners to, to build the to design and build the systems. So um, I, I guess it just makes me wonder. It's just one example, so maybe I you know shouldn't read too far into it. But it just makes me wonder, do we have or should we have some compact with CU, CU South as we talk about expansion? And we have transportation advocates out there saying, yeah, this is all a great idea because this is this is a precondition for <laughs> decoupling people from cars. But if you know, do we have an assurance that that's actually the, the plan or, or an intended goal of this um, from university side or from the partnership side, I guess? So it's sort of a big, a big one, probably not easy to answer on the spot. But I thought that Kurt um, and the and this community cycle team are really kind of prodding at something that's fundamental to a lot of the support that that transportation advocates like me have for the for the thing. I can go to the the last one. <laughs> there's any uh, anyone? Well, I'm sure there's a question there. <laughs> um, Natalie, are you aware of what any next steps might be on right right on that side? and especially as it pertains to the Grandview and Broadway intersection. Yeah, you can just share. We're having a site visit with CU staff, um, I believe community cycles and council members tomorrow, planning development services and transportation um, staff are attending that tomorrow afternoon. So we'll have a chance to walk the site and talk to um, the various stakeholders about the project. Um, now, Natalie, I'm, I'm not sure which transportation staff you think is coming because I'm looking at the emails coming through this evening and I my my information is that no CU transportation staff is going to be at that. Site oh, visit. sorry. I meant City of Boulder transportation staff, myself. Okay, oh, okay. <laughs> yourself. Okay, good. <laughs> I 
Okay, so so next, so okay. Um, what it, I guess maybe next, Lana, I'd be we'd be I'd be eager to just I guess follow this. I don't you know I don't want to like bird dog every little thing here, but um, be interested to hear. There's a lot of I mean I think there's a lot of interest from the community. That's right. Um, so. And then I guess so I guess I will be more explicit on the question. I had a second point, which was or sort of a point that um, we don't. It's not clear to me that my assumption that compact development through C CU annexation has a has a multimodalization plan has a has a plan for V. I know there's VMT um, production targets associated with it in their various measures, but I guess it's just sort of this this broader idea of like if when we have uh, these these construction projects, build projects are. Um, are they uh, like informed, you know, by strategically by a, you know, a plan, a plan to, to do this much? It can be rhetorical, but if yeah, if, there's, if you have any thoughts on it, I'd love to I'd love to know. Yeah, it, um, maybe Ryan, you and I can have more conversation about this. I think um, certainly the answer is yes. You know, through our development review process, we um, have process in place that is seeking to implement our TMP um, and. And obviously, that's a very broad statement, but um, you know, we can have some follow up about that if you want to kind of dig deeper into it. Thanks, thanks for the invitation. Yeah, maybe it's me. Maybe it's community cycles. I, yeah, it just feels like yeah, it makes sense that there's a, a large framework, but then like it seems like this is something that ought to have gotten caught in a in a good good large framework. So um, I'm happy to leave it out as this for now. If maybe I'll think of something to follow up, but I just I don't want to. One thing I will just say, and I know there's been a lot of emails with this kind of message um, about the CU Conference Center, but so um, through our regulatory environment, we cannot require CU to close Grandview um, because of their state entity or state institution status. And so if there's a desire to close Grandview um, and council would like staff to explore that, that would need to be a transportation project that would, you know, essentially become a planning process and into the CIP if that was council's desire. But it wouldn't be able to occur through the CU conference development. Unless okay. CU agreed or decided that that was desirable, right? Right. Thank you. Okay, Alex, can I just, I'll do the last one real quick. Mm -hmm. Okay, Natalie, this will be a question for you. I just wanted to follow up on a, um, email that our uh, illustrious alumnus, Mark McIntyre, uh, now on the planning board, wrote a, a couple, somewhat recently, within the last week, on the uh, DCS update and site triangles around 15th and, um, and Iris. And I don't want to answer the whole thing right now. We don't need to. But I just wanted to say I'd love to um, for us to just so one way or another follow up on that and get to just at least answer the questions. Mark had a few questions. And so people know the, the general the sort of point was, um, 15th and Iris, there seems to be um, uh, uh, site, site line um, type issues and, and related issues around crossing that don't feel safe and they seem probably inconsistent with either current or some proposed uh, future plans. Um, and this is a section that's it's a, it's a crossing and it's really a key core part of the town that's really unserved by protected bikeways elsewhere. So he had a few questions. I just wanted to flag that, that I'd love, if, if helpful, I could join, join a call. Um, Offline, or we can answer the topics now, but these seem like pretty big ones that were former, um, formerly on our plate, and we they kind of fell off. I think. Sure. Yeah, I think um, Garrett's available and can speak to this um, question. I believe about the site triangles in relation to Fifteenth and Iris. Yeah, I appreciate you raising this, Ryan. So the uh, the site triangle modification that is being proposed for the Boulder Revised Code is increasing the site triangle for vehicles coming off of driveways and alleys approaching a multi-use path to change it from a 15 by 15 to a 15 by 96. And the condition which is proposed for 15, 15th and Iris is for vehicles approaching a sidewalk, not a multi-use path, and also for um, the, uh, the cyclists that would be on the multi-use path about to cross Fifth, uh, excuse me, to about to cross Iris. So the application of the the, the change that's proposed for the the, the 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 city code is not directly applicable to the situation at 15th and Iris. However, I I think um, 
the uh, sustenance of Mark's uh, feedback about making sure we have adequate sight distance is an important one. And so the design has contemplated that and considered perception reaction time and making sure that there is uh, adequate visibility for the cyclists approaching the intersection as well as for vehicles coming in off of Iris onto 15th Street. Okay, thanks, Garrett. And then just for clarification, the current design is the, is the same one as we last saw, I believe it was November 8th, that hasn't changed since then. Right, the, the same general geometric lay, layout that was pre, uh, presented before is the same as it is today. Okay, and that, that meets current code, where you feel satisfied that that meets current code? It does. Okay, that's all I have, unless anybody else wants to pile on to this one. Okay, thanks everybody for your attention. Right. If there aren't any other open board comments, uh, future agenda topics, it looks like next month will be fairly busy and Tila, you will not be present, correct? Gotcha. Um, any other topics that members of the board would like us to potentially add at future meetings and, and Ryan, I can, can chat with staff about getting it on the schedule. not seen any. Um, with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Thanks, Ryan. I'll, I'll second. Third. <laughs> now we can get out early. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night, Nicole. Thank you for being here. <laughs>